So let's let's do this. Okay, we're recording. So uh, I'll let me share my stuff. I think this is it. Okay. Just a sec. What's going on? Yeah. So this is called on the equality of all minds. Uh, this was actually part of a. Uh, a course I gave to at the new center for research and practice uh, a few months ago. Uh, in that course, actually, the it was called um, from from world making to life forming, and I was engaging with the idea, you know, that you find both in Nelson Goodman, like this philosopher of language that I studied for a long time, uh, that's trying to think of, you know. Uh, scientific theory and uh, artistic works and every symbolizing activity as some kind of world making because he's an anti-foundationalist philosopher. He's not thinking that there is a reality out there to be simply described. So this is the gist of world making. Uh, but there is a lot of a lot to, to be unpacked in that. I, I won't be doing this today. I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm not giving that same, that same, the, the same stuff that I gave in that class. It's it's slightly different, slightly reoriented. Uh, so in that class, I was I was trying to tackle this problem of world making, which is a linguistic or a symbolizing practice. I was trying to uh, compatibilize or at least compare it to you know the Badiouian framework that we are in in this group in this group we are more familiar with. Of logics of worlds, the idea of uh, a kind of a world multiplicity, but that is not um, that is not uh, constituted linguistically. So this was one of the main issues, philosophical issues of the course. And the second wing of it, you know, from world making to life forming, it had to do with the idea of forms of life uh, in the Wittgensteinian sense as uh, some kind of uh, a kind of a uh, not a foundation, but a kind of a, the way our engagements with the world are um, determined by a certain uh, a certain morphology of action that is embedded in you know the societies that we live in in a, in a sense. So a form of life might be something like the unfolding of practices in accordance to unstated rules, something like that, right? So this was a part of, you know, the, the device that Wittgenstein, which is this, also this anti-foundationalist philosopher, right, tried to diffuse any appeal to absolute foundations, to Platonism. Uh, this was part of his, his way of dealing with the fact that we act determinately, but uh, this determination must come from somewhere that is not metaphysically uh, uh, constituted. But uh, he tried to reduce this kind of determinacy to, you know, social determinacy in a sense. But the problem with Wittgenstein was the fact that he form of life was is usually the end point of an investigation, not the beginning. So life forming was my. Um, uh, neologism for using forms of life as a platform for further elaboration, not not just to shut up the Platonist in a sense, but to begin a kind of uh, elaboration that uh, would would have uh, political consequences in the sense of you know the material of which is behavior or linguistically mediated behavior or uh, vice versa, uh, behaviorally mediated language, which is like a, a unity within a distinction or a distinction within a unity, which is something that I'll, I'll insist upon here in this, in this presentation. But uh, in order to reorient all this, this problem to, to our problems, I'm taking again the, the, uh, the presentation that I did with uh, Pedro last time about Justin Evans's paper Capital the space of reasons. Uh, this is his uh, his conclusion at the time. We, I mean, I was talking to John uh, right now that I think I changed a little bit my position regarding that paper. 
at that point I was skeptical of thinking of capital as a, as a space of reasons because it seemed to me much more to um, elect a pattern governed behavior more than rule obeying behavior. But we do objectify it in, in a sense, the pattern at least up to a point. So it seems to fall back onto the thinking of scales to understand actually to, and to make to disambiguate between, you know, the pattern governed behavior and the rule obeying behavior. But, uh, but you, this will be clearer in the next, in the next uh, frame. So introduction problems we were left with, Evans's conclusion of capital as a space of reason. So this is Evans's text. This is what we see with capital, the creation of new value here in the form of money. This new value is not any different from the value at the start. They are both money. Whereas in CMC, the commodities must be different for the exchange to make any sense. But the quantity of money has altered. So this cycle can, in theory, continue. But we all are very familiar with this, right? So this is why Marx calls value the automatic subject. It appears to be a fully independent, self-increasing system. It is also the self-moving substance. There can be little doubt that Marx is mocking Hegel here. At the same time, his use of this rhetoric brings the horror of capitalism home because it shows such a stark contrast to German idealism's insistence on the nature of modern subjectivity and freedom. So I, I'm referring back to that presentation, so I won't be really explaining that again. So I, I, I take it that you saw it. To move even further into the language I have been using here, if capital is the subject, that is also a substance, that is Geist. And if Geist is a set of concepts that can, we can imagine as a space of reasons, we can claim that a society structured by the economic demands of capital is a space of reasons. The contradiction of capitalism is that freedom is denied to us by the very space of reasons that is supposed to make freedom possible. So this is actually, actually has a nice uh, relationship to actually the left accelerationist thesis that you know uh, there is something in capital that is an enabling condition, but at the same time, capital is uh, pushing back, uh, 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 keeping keeping it from fully developing beyond the limits of its own morphology, in a sense. Uh, but this was Evans' uh, conclusion. Uh, one of the, uh, I'm not sure this is very important, but this is one of the issues that he was dealing with in that paper. The idea, uh, just to characterize this space of reasons thing. So, but if one cannot have an individual concept without having more than that individual concept, then a concept cannot fulfill one of the conditions of a given. No concept can be independent of other cognitive states because all concepts necessarily rely on other concepts. So this is a basic idea of a space of reasons is the fact that you cannot acquire a concept in isolation from other concepts. So you have to always have a kind of a web of concepts. Uh, I would say almost a web of belief in the Quinean sense, but a web of concepts in order to be able to acquire knowledge in the sense of the Pittsburgh school that was uh, an object of this paper by Evans last time, right? This suggests that if there is to be a given, it must be a non-conceptual. So instead of the concept of gene, you might try to found, found knowledge on the immediate visual appearance of colorless liquid. But this given would fail to fulfill the other condition of the given, that it justify further cognitive states. So this idea of the given that they were, they were discussing had to do with the fact that the given was supposed to provide a foundation for knowledge. So, uh, this is uh, this is the main uh, internal contradiction of the notion of a given, because either it is a concept, and because it is a concept, it must be enmeshed with other concepts. So it has right there a kind of constructive and uh, uh, leeway space for construction that makes it also relative to a certain to a certain web of of, of concepts. And uh, so it, 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 it is not a starting point. While if it is a starting point, it cannot provide knowledge because it is not enmeshed in the conceptual web. So this is the problem. There's, there's, uh, this is, Evans is trying, this pitting coherentism against the idea of the given because of that. You know, 
it's the coherence of a certain system that makes it possible to explain things, while at the same time the given by itself, by itself, is not uh, is not uh, capable of making this by itself. So this is uh, the basic uh, contradiction between the given and the philosophy of the space of reasons in that sense. Uh, so. La, 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 la. This suggests that if there is to be a given, it must be non-conceptual. So instead, uh, let me just read, read it out. But this given would fail to fulfill the other condition of the given, that it justify further cognitive states. This is because sellers and those who follow him take rationality, judgments, influence, concept usage to be normative and not just causal. This is very important. Although the light bouncing off the tumbler will cause certain effects on my retina, uh, they in turn will cause neurochemical effects and so on. None of these causal effects suffices to produce thought. Thought is not merely causal. It is not what Brandon calls a reliable differential response disposition. Reliable differential response disposition is just, for instance, when a piece of metal rusts in contact with, you know, salt, salty water or salty wind or something, salty air, you know. Uh, this is a, uh, for Brandon, this is a RDRD, Reliable Differential Response Disposition. Um, and it is classifying the environment in a sense, because without certain properties in the environment, it wouldn't rust. So in a sense, it is classifying the environment by giving a differential response. But the piece of metal does not know what follows from this classification. So this is not, of course, we, we would have to be animists to say that you know the piece of metal has conceptual behavior. But nevertheless, it's because of that that is the piece of metal doesn't exhibit conceptual behavior or even a parrot for Brandon. This, this much, I, I don't like this. Is comparison between pieces of metal and parrots. I think it's rather reductive, but they think usually that animals are capable usually of RDRDs, but not full-fledged conceptual behavior because of that. They can reliably uh, respond, but they can't, they can't really um, uh, act in accordance of that piece as a piece of knowledge. And this, this, this has to do with, with, with being capable of making inferences. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, from the beginning of this slide, um, can you say what the, if, if there's like a relation between the given and the space of reasons? Is the given something like, uh, I guess like the endpoints of the space of reasons or something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the issue. The <laughs> given cannot be, the given cannot cannot provide the foundation that, you know, usually the foundation is philosophers that appeal to the given they wanted to, to, to provide, you know. Mm -hmm. It is not able because it, it, it has to fulfill two conditions at the same time. It has to be apodictic, like you cannot doubt it because it is given. But at the same, at the same time, it, it has to justify further inferences. And just, just, just that that piece of given thing is not able to justify anything because it's not conceptual. So this is this is the issue. So you have like this gap that is open between a piece of you know experience that is given and a web of concepts that wherein you can justify things and make inferences and all of that. So you know, Salas has a has a has a kind of a, um, a ingenious. Uh, response to that, uh, he's, he talks a lot about language entry transitions, intra-language transitions, and uh, uh, language uh, um, uh, exit transitions. So uh, an RDRD can function as a language entry transition. Right? You are responding differentially, you know, and this will then uh, get 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 caught within a certain form of conceptualization. But the minimal gap that you get between, you know, the uh, between facts, between sheer facts, matter of factual uh, things out there, you know, and the way we are conceptualizing it, 
creates a kind of a lingui space wherein you know you can reconceptualize thing, things in a sense. When you acknowledge a cause or a law as a norm, and this is the basic gist, you are able to elaborate this norm further or even to shift a little bit the mappings you get between the space of reasons and the regularities that you are observing. This is a basic gist of, of you know, I mean, the cash value, I think, of this, of this position in the philosophical sense. Um, so, uh, so this is still about, uh, well, this is what I, I just explained it. It's, a, it's still about the last session that we had together. And this is very important, this difference between pattern governed and rule obeying behavior and very difficult to pinpoint, really. So this is a uh, piece of text by Ray Brassier that talks about it. He's, he's interpreting sellers here. Pattern governed behavior is ubiquitous in the biological and physical realms. Physical systems realize complex patterns without intending them. This bit I, I don't like much, but we'll, we'll get to that. The pattern is incarnated by the components of the system, each part of which constitutes, con constitutes it, but the constitution is effectuated by something as mindless as a wiring diagram. The latter mechanism codes for the pattern without the structure of the pattern having to be represented by any part of it. Thus the turns and wiggles performed by a dancing bee occur for a reason, to communicate information about flowers. Without this reason being intended, the bee has no mind with which it can intend to realize the dance. So this is a quote by Sellers. What would it mean to say of a bee returning from a clover field that its turnings and wigglings occur because they are part of a complex dance? Would this commit us to the idea that the bee envisages the dance and acts as it does by virtue of intending to realize the dance? If we reject this idea, must we refuse to say that the dance pattern as a whole is involved in the occurrence of each wiggle in turn? Clearly not. It is open to us to give an evolutionary account of the phenomenon of the dance and hence to interpret the statement that this wiggle occurred because of the complex dance to which it belongs, which appears as before to attribute causal force to an abstraction and hence tempts us to draw upon the mentalistic language of intention and purpose in terms of the survival value to groups of bees of these forms of behavior. In this interpretation, the dance pattern comes in not as an abstraction, but as exemplified by the behavior of particular bees. What does it mean to say that a bee's wiggling is part of a dance or to explain its wiggling by saying that each wiggle occurs because of the dance? To say this is to say that organic movement happens for a reason. It has an adaptive function. But this reason or function is not represented in the brain of the organism motivated by it. This is to distinguish between doing something for a reason and doing something because of a reason. The ability to do something because of a reason arises from the capacity to do something for a reason. Yet it should not be confused with it. So this is the very delicate difference between you know doing something for a reason and doing something because of a reason actually in this extract it, it kind of hangs upon the idea of you you having like a representation of what you are doing in a sense but i don't think this should be the disambiguating um, the disambiguating criteria the criteria must be normative the difference between you know acting rule of being behavior is that it is normative in a sense that it is uh, subjected to assessment of correction. You can do it wrong. While something that just happens, it can't be wrong, it just happens. So this, this uh, kind of uh, encodes the difference between the space of reasons and the space of natural causes. Natural causes are not wrong or right, they just happen, right? So uh, this, is, this is actually the, actually the disambiguating um, disambiguating criterion, really. Uh, not so much the organism having, I'm, I'm trying to, you, you are already seeing, I'm trying to disentangle my position from the position of subjective phenomenology. 
So I'm trying to say, okay, it's not about objective or subjective phenomenology, it's about uh, normative and causal. Mm -hmm. So is capital an impoverished space of reasons? This was actually the, uh, our Maya and Pedro uh, conclusion at that point. I shift a little bit because I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree fully with what we said at that point. So I, I change a little bit just to, because I, I, I read again, I thought, I, thought, I thought again about it. So capital is not reducible to immediate causes. The problem of scales presents itself in the electing of abstractions out of social practice that are enmeshed with the game of giving and asking for reasons. The space of reasons is entangled not with causal unfoldings, but with justifications. Its purport is normative. It has to do with drawing correct inferences. In our B example, it's not concerned with matter of factual unfoldings of the dance, but with once the dance is objectified, going on correctly. So it's a difference between, you know, a kind of causal kind of description and a normative kind of description. So to account for the mutual influence between the exceptionally complex space of causes, I'm calling it the space of causes, the field, that is capitalism and the space of reasons, a more nuanced approach to the problem of the disambiguation between norms and causes ought to be provided as well as of their occasional overlaps, which cuts across the distinction between concreteness and abstraction. This is to say, it's not because it, it's a causal space that is concrete and the normative space is abstract. No, the concrete and abstraction are there both in the space of causes in the space of norms or reasons as well. So while not having a complete account to offer for it, a few pointers can be taken from the Pittsburgh approach. Reasoning is a doing. Doings are articulated within not one, but at least two spaces at once. Causal natural space of occurrences and normative rational space of justification. The grounding of reason, though in practice might yield a few interesting research topics regarding the relation between capital and the space of reason. So uh, at that point, uh, Pedro will remember, we, we kind of said, no, it's not an impoverished space of reasons. I, I kind of still agree with, with it, but I think I, I shifted a little bit. It's not just that capital is a, is, is a causal space and, you know, so it's not an impoverished space of reason. It is that is a, there is a, a kind of a leeway space, a kind of a, indistinguishable space between being a space of causes and a space of reasons because um, in a sense it deals with abstractions that emerge from social social practices um, the problem is that the abstractions with with which we recognize what's happening they are the ideological counterparts of you know what the marxist kind of analysis is providing for you know uh, analyzing this space so it's there is a lot to unpack in that. I think that not, it's not that uh, paper, Evans's paper is wrong. It's kind of a, it, it is kind of simplified in a sense. It's, it's, it, ha it has a lot lot more work to be done in order to make this uh, relationship, I mean, uh, tenable, right? So space of reasons and their construction of freedom. So there is a reason. There is a, a kind of. A, uh, an understanding of freedom that comes from this kind of philosophy. So negative and positive freedoms to get an intuitive sense of how such a capacity can, can sensibly be thought of a kind of positive freedom. It is helpful to think of an example suggested by the guiding metaphor of Kant's popular essay, Vassist Aufklärung. Consider what happens when a young person achieves her legal majority. This is typical Kant, right? Like it has to, has to do with legal legal stuff. Suddenly, uh, <laughs> she has the authority to bind herself legally, for instance, by entering into contracts that gives her a host of new abilities to borrow money, take out a mortgage, start a business. The new authority to bind oneself normatively to take on these new normative statuses involve a huge increase in positive freedom. Well, you, you can do a lot more because you bound yourself to these norms. So, what this gives us is not, you know, for instance, the libertarian space of freedom that is usually thought of as a negative freedom, like you take out constraints and now you're free. No, this is not, the, this is not how it goes here. You have to have always constraints and these constraints can have a 
limiting effect or an enabling effect depending of its bootstrapping capacities. So this is a, an important issue. So the thing is when you, since it, uh, to enter into a contract is a conditional upon some other activities, you are actually giving a bit of freedom in order to have a, to have a, a host of new abilities as, as Brandon says. So in this account, far from being incompatible with constraint, freedom consists in a distinctive kind of constraint, constraint by norms. This sounds paradoxical, but it is not. The positive freedom Kant is describing is a practical capacity to be bound by discursive norms. This is a capacity that is compatible with, but extends beyond being bound by the laws that govern natural beings. Again, you have this uh, overlap between, you know, natural, uh, natural uh, uh, impulsiveness and uh, normative compulsoriness. But uh, the, example, the, the example from Kant is perfect also because, you know, every kind of text on bourgeois ideology written by Marxists take precisely critique of Kant in the sense of, yes, it's so beautiful, I can commit myself to many things and increase my responsibility and self-determination. How about the wage contract? Yeah, of which is yeah. the freedom to sell your freedom like yeah. it's a normative yeah. commitment but where would it fall here no it would fall as uh, the limit uh, the limit case of this like you, you are you are not really free to to sell your freedom right you are constrained to sell your freedom in a limiting sense so this is the limit case, really. This is why this is not enough. This is not sufficient, right? But there is something to be taken, something interesting to be taken out of it, which is this conception of, you know, freedom is not just about, I think, even the Marxist. Uh, Marx no, totally, totally, totally. That point, I think it's, it's, it's established. It's just that I just realized that there is a nice argument inside the sort of classic examples of Kant that is yeah. a nice kind of, limit points to the idea of yeah it's really point, exactly. because it is it is re you're required to enter into it freely i mean yeah that's the whole point if the cap capitalist could com directly compel you through power it wouldn't be the wage labor that it needs to be because you need to be responsible for your own survival right remember yeah. we're talking about this right i need to be responsible for that contract in such a way that because i'm a free individual I buy my subsistence in the market. If I were treated like a like a slave or somebody who is not responsible and free, I would be taken care of by the person who employed me, right? But yeah. precisely because yeah. I'm treated as a free being, that I'm doubly exploited. So yeah. it's a weird point for you know. It's not a matter of like removing constraints. I agree that argument is a different one, but it's a it's a nice kind of. Twisted yeah, it's, it's actually, actually, it's, it's quite interesting because it is, in a sense, uh, uh, it is it is a kind of a, a way to describe what's going on. That is, in a sense, uh, using this this Kantian framework, right? Uh, and it's uh, illuminating in some sense, like it is a limit. It's a limit case. It's a limit point where you enter into something. But this entrance is not really up to you, even if you are treated as being up to you in a sense, yeah. right? So this is what the, this was a point. Yeah, this is a good point. I think it's uh, it is food for thought in the sense that maybe there is something within this uh, this kind of approach. I mean, this illustrates uh, limiting constraints within the space of reasons that. I mean, the uh, practical elaboration might have to take care of, but we don't know really how. This is a problem, and maybe this might be might might give um, water to the to Evans's mill, you know, in the sense of capital being an impoverished space of reasons. Like we ought to, we should be able to enter or not into a contract, while a contract of wage labor is really absolutely, uh, in a sense, uh, 
imposed upon us, right? Yeah, it's so, weird yeah. because it takes it's an imposition that needs to take the form of a free act. Like you yeah. cannot enter into it if you yeah. state out loud, I'm not signing this contract, I'm obliged to sign it. But yeah. in that case, the contract is voided. And yeah. the capitalist wouldn't even make surplus if he accepted it. If he said, yes, you're obliged, this is slavery, uh, it wouldn't work. So it's a very weird. Uh, yeah, 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 it's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Am, I, am I right to say that this is almost like a, like a collectivizing reading of Kant, where like the norms go up to like the level of like society? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually in the in the Evans paper he, he, he said so much like it's a kind of analytic Hegelianism. So it's the way they update Kant with Hegel. It's not really Hegel in the in the continental sense or in the, for instance, in the Ljubljana sense, but this is a, for for the critics is a kind of Kantianized Hegel, which is uh, what's what's going on in this. Um, Many, some of those people that are um, related to this Pittsburgh school, right? But yes, something like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, okay. So a set of problems. So this this was this much was in the in the course I gave. So within the Badius framework, the premise of languages is skewed in favor of consequences of logical mathematical scaffoldings. That are taken to be facts of structure. So this was because this was uh, this this frame was in the, my fourth class in that in that seminar. Third class was about logics of worlds that was uh, tackled this this idea of you know worlds having a certain kind of consistency that was exhibited by the formalisms that he that he uses. Within the constraints of this structure, there is thinking, which takes the form not of linguistic reasoning but of truth procedures, doings that follow imminently their own axiomatization out of the matter that constitute situations slash worlds. So this is a very, 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 um, uh, I'd say that a very uh, condensed form of, of talking about truth procedures that takes into account uh, the four, four forms of change that uh, the chapter on the four forms of change that is in logics of worlds. Uh, wherein there is this uh, interplay between form and matter, right? So uh, this is because this was talked about in the third session. So, but the initial commitment of the concept ladenness of our doings is prima facie in conflict with this conclusion, because concept ladenness seems to require space of reasons or space of language or something like that. So is it possible to compatibilize these commitments through a localized account of practice that doesn't skew linguistic behavior as explanation. This will be approached in what follows through an engagement with two different ways of understanding a similar thesis. There are thoughts that are not thought by an individual. The two approaches are Rosengarstani's idea of the equality of all minds associated with the formal sociality of reason that has to do with what Yasha was, was saying, like this social, what do you say that, like uh, socializing of, of, of norms. Kantian norms in a sense, and the one offered by Gabriel Tupinaba, our very own friend here in Freeing Thought from Thinkers, <laughs> more attuned to the practical dimension of political organizing as it appears in our former, I added this it's very sad, sad yeah, no. former collective circle of studies of the idea and ideology. Okay, so let's go on the equality of all minds. So the final chapter of Rezengarstani's Intelligence and Spirit is the unfolding of the thesis of philosophy as a program that starts from the thesis of the equality of all minds. So here's uh, Reza. Central thesis of this final chapter is that philosophy is at its deepest level a program, a collection of action principles and practices or operations which involve realizabilities, i.e. what can possibly be brought about by a specific category of properties or forms. And that to properly define philosophy and to highlight its significance, we should approach philosophy by first examining its programmatic nature. This means that rather than starting the inquiry into the nature of philosophy by asking what is philosophy trying to say, what does it really mean, what is its application, does it have any relevance, we should ask what sort of program is philosophy, how does it function, what are its operational effects, what realizabilities specific to each forms, does it elaborate, and finally as a program, what kinds of experimentation does it involve. So 
uh, right from the start, you will see that oh, this has, why is it talking about philosophy? Well, yes, there is a shift of a certain, the object of his thinking from the labor of the inhuman to uh, intelligence and spirit. In the labor of the inhuman, it was in a sense more specific, uh, both more specific and more general, but you will recognize the same form of unfolding here, right? In the labor of the inhuman, it, it had to do with, uh, um, shall I say, Bajuian fidelity to, to the concept of the human understood in the Brandomian sense. So you like, you have to, you have to uh, update your commitments in order to keep this, uh, this fidelity to the concept of the human up to a point where the human is uh, uh, denaturalized into something other than itself, in a sense. So this happens in the labor of the human because of this inferentialist account of reason that has to do with what I, I've been saying here, the space of reasons, right? Uh, and one of the stations of that in the labor of the human had to do with some kind of political instantiation, uh, a multi-leveled approach. Uh, I was discussing this with John earlier. Uh, yeah, I have a quote about this later. So one of the, of the stations of this has had to do with, uh, you know, political uh, instantiation, political realizabilities, in a sense. So Reza is always dealing with um, thinking as a kind of doing, right? And if thinking is always enmeshed in a space of constraints and affordances, it is always uh, uh, programming itself and, and uh, it is always uh, uh, assembling itself out of the same space of affordances and constraints that is in the space of reason, right? But it is also a kind of doing, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about that because every assertion in this account counts as an act. So when you assert, you are saying something, but you, you are asserting, which is a kind of action, like you are endorsing some commitment so you are committing. This is a kind of act. So this is why language use is always a doing as well. Every, everything you say is also an act. So here's a kind of a limit to what this, this approach is, is proposing. It's, it's, I think it's quite interesting. I think it, it, you can do a lot with it, but it is building against, uh, I'm, I'm kind of using a Gallicism here. Contre quelque chose. No, it's not that. It's actually uh, 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 limiting, uh, facing a kind of limit of its own, you know, real realization in reality. So it's not sufficient to, you know, elaborate the concept of the human or the concept or philosophy, even if it is giving us uh, practical imperatives or a kind of uh, 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 regulative ideals, this is not enough for, you know, political organizing, if this is the object. And this chapter, this final chapter of uh, Intelligence and Spirit has this political overtone that is very, very present here. Like philosophy itself is a program that is kind of pursued for a few thousand years now, 2000 years, at least, uh, more than 2000 years now. And uh, it has to do with the cultivation of intelligence as such. And intelligence has to do with the extraction of intelligibilities. I think it's a very beautiful thesis, but uh, uh, part of this, one part of these intelligibilities has to do with achieving the good life. And this is where the political comes in, but it is always already very, um, very theoretical in a sense. This is consistent with our life forming hypothesis in the sense that if philosophy is here a program that has operational effects upon the one philosophizing, chances are that forms of life might be somewhat shifted by the exercise of philosophy. In the later part of this presentation, we will engage with the work of a friend and collaborator, Gabriel Tupinamba, that this lodges the problem of life forming to concrete organizational practice instead of philosophy as such. So here's still a more Reza. Philosophy begins with a universal thesis 
regarding the equality of all minds, that whoever or whatever satisfies the basic conditions of its possibility should be seen as and treated as equal in the broadest possible sense. But as a discipline of philosophizing becomes more mature, it ought to realize that there is in fact a significant truth to these accusations of philosophy as a Western self-entitled mode of thinking, however ill-judged they may seem. The equality of minds as a thesis about what is true and what is just is a dictum universal and necessary in its truth and applicability. But that does not mean that is concretely universal for us. It is something to be achieved and concretely instituted. So this is a very typical of uh, Reza's way of uh, thinking. Uh, many, the problem of instantiation get deferred to uh, kind of a, a practical recipe you might get from uh, the imminent elaboration of a certain notion. So this is this is this is this is a gesture you you see a lot, even in the labor of the human that I asked you for to take a look at, and in intelligence and spirit as well. So the condition of the equality of all minds is one of whose recognition and realization demand struggle and a constant campaign against the prevalent system of exploitation. But insofar as exploitation as that which obscures this equality can only be challenged by attending to the questions of what we ought to think and what we ought to do. It is only by committing to elaborating the primary datum of philosophy, i.e. that thinking is possible, that we can begin to fight the condition of exploitation. So, in other words, thinking is a condition for uh, uh, surpassing a condition of exploitation. Otherwise, you won't, you won't be able to do it. This is kind of a truism in a sense. So the primary focus of the connective program is to method methodically compel thinking to identify and bring about its realizabilities, namely what arises from the exercise of its theoretical and practical powers, and to explore what can possibly come out of thinking and what thought as an act and as the object of its act can become. As will be argued, it is within the overarching scope of this cognitive uh, program that philosophy's thesis of the equality of all minds can be concretely elaborated as an emancipatory project. So uh, there is a specific way that uh, Reza um, understands this process. Um, he, he's, uh, this is interesting because of uh, the uh, possible ramifications in relation to uh, the Badiouian framework, the axiomatics, you know, that are in place in any truth, in every truth procedure. But here, as you all see, this is a different orientation of thought. Do you remember? Uh, I think I discussed this, I'm not sure, last time, about the orientations of thought. In in the case of Badiou philosophy, it doesn't doesn't unify anything really. It's just the truth procedures are are are, are separate and imminent and autonomous in order to elaborate their own, their own unfoldings, okay? So here, as I is kind of centralizing this on this big, um, big uh, endeavor that is philosophy. And he is understanding philosophy not as an axiomatic in the Euclidean sense, uh, not using uh, axiomatics in the Euclidean sense, data, data that are presented as, as evidence, something like that but as uh, truth candidates, elaboration of truth candidates. This, is, uh, this, uh, this I think, it's very interesting. Uh, the last uh, paper that I published like last week was about this guy, Henry Flint. That is uh, just, just a like, quick digression. That he's kind of a global nihilist, cognitive nihilist, meaning that uh, Flint, <laughs> Flint is weird because Flint is a Marxist or was a Marxist. But at the same time, he's a cognitive nihilist. He doesn't think that uh, it is possible globally to have knowledge. This is very, very weird. He has a reasoning for that. But uh, the thing is that uh, with this kind of, uh, uh, I use this kind of Negaristanian approach of truth candidates and a kind of abductive form of realism in order to uh, save the idea that you can have knowledge even with uh, the way Flint is doing, working with, you know, uh, inconsistencies and logical impossibilities. So uh, sometime I, I, I'll send that to you at some point. It was, um, it's something that interests me. So uh, in contrast to this Euclidean notion of data, 
what are presented here as, as data are not axioms or truth givens. It could be axioms, but he's using axioms in the old Greek sense, right? But what are called truth candidates. Data in this sense refers to a family of truth presumptive claims that are truth embracing. In themselves, they have no claim to any truth. In other words, as opposed to truth givens, in which a truth is attached to a single datum, truth candidates, although constructive elements, do not build the system on given truth. Hey, Enzo is waiting. Okay. Uh, uh, how does this work? I'm sorry, uh, on given truth. Rather, the process of the construction itself becomes a process of determination of truth. How does this work? So this is the important part. As mentioned, data or truth candidates by themselves individually have no truth significance. They instead permit the instantiation of a logical space that encompasses all them all. The criterion of plausibility of each datum, rather than its truth, is determined by how it hangs together with other data within this logical space. This is the coherentist web uh, of data, a system of semantic transparency of or coherence. It is only through the coherency analysis of this network that truth candidates can be added, revised, or subtracted. More importantly, the navigation of this coherentist network or logical space is exactly the process of construction and exploration that has a uh, that has a truth indicative weight. In a system built on the basis of a series of truth givings, cognitive labor cumulatively moves outward from through and at the expense of the security afforded by its fundamentals. In the coherentist network instead, the direction of orientation is inward, moving contractively from the boundaries roughly demarcated by the network of insecure candidates to a more determined domain of truth. In the course of this inward navigation, sometimes the boundaries of the system will have to be readjusted to accommodate additional truth candidates or to discard some of the existing ones. The definition of constructors and the structures that follow shortly. Okay, this is because the whole chapter is based on a sequence of 10 different truth candidates about philosophy. Right. I don't think we need to go through every one of them, but I nevertheless um, they are there. Uh, I can just uh, not read the whole thing, but uh, just uh, the first phrase, the first the first expression of each one. So the the whole chapter is just that is 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 developing these different datums that are candidates, truth candidates about the unfolding, historical unfolding of philosophy as a program that is elaborating a set of abilities that has to do with the extraction of intelligibility of the world on worlds. This is also a kind of a different, a difference, because for instance, there is a universe of worlds here, which, which is absent from Badiou's point of view. It's not, there's no one, right? But here you have a universe of worlds because Reza is in the criteriological or constructivist uh, orientation of thought, not the generic one. Uh, okay, so following that data should therefore be understood in the sense of data as a family of truth candidates and not as truths or self-evident givens. So data in one, we exercised. <laughs> Traditionally, philosophy is an aesthetic program. Data two, philosophy, the way of world building. So philosophy is an organ for world building. This, this datum was uh, unfolded in that course because I had to talk about uh, Nelson Goodman, the way he, he used Goodman's uh, categories of world making in this, in this part of the text. Datum three, actualizing the possibility of thinking conceived as a program. Philosophy is an inquiry into the realization of all possible forms of photonition and what might arise from the exercise of forms thus realized. Datum four, Navigating thoughts are ramified paths. Philosophy is a program whose primary data are those pertaining to the possibility of thinking as such. Its task is to elaborate the realizabilities behind this possibility in terms of what can be done with thought or more broadly, what thought can realize out of itself. If thought is or could be possible at all, then what would be the ramifications of such possibility? Datum five, thought and the artifact. By reformatting thinking from a byproduct of material and social organization. 
into a programmatic normative enterprise that rigorously inquires into its operational and constructive possibilities, philosophy introduces a vision of the artificial into the practice of thinking, rather than a thought that is simply accustomed to the use of artifacts and has a concept of artificiality. This is a thought that is itself a practice of artificialization and becomes the artifact of its own ends. I, I will talk a bit about this one after. Datum 6, philosophy as an Archimedean lever for lifting intelligence and moving the world. Well, I'll skip that one, it's quite, quite long. Datum 7, crafting the ultimate form, just as the inception of philosophy coincides with the speculative futures of general intelligence. So its ultimate task corresponds with the ultimate form of intelligence. Datum 8, the yearning for the better. The task of humanity is to make something better than itself. This is the one and only dictum through which philosophy as that which has a history and not a nature, perilously realize its craft, the ultimate form of intelligence. The risks it takes in order to understand and realize the good, culminating the realization of that which is better. The image of this form of intelligence is an acrobat who has learned that only by presupposing his full suspension in the abyss can he perform the greatest feats of acrobatics. Datum nine, intelligence as risk and time. Intelligence without risk is an empty thought, as is an intelligence whose realization takes no time. Risk and time are the presuppositions for the history of intelligence. So this is kind of a Hegelian, Hegelian point right there, that, that you know, intelligence takes time to exteriorize itself, to assemble itself. So time is not, uh, it's not a given either. It's, it's something that is uh, a necessary condition of you know, in the construction of intelligibility. Datum 10, a view from nowhere and no one, philosophy as intelligence and time. While the history of intelligence begins from death as a condition of enabling, enablement, it extends by way of a view from nowhere and no when, through which complete totalities are removed and replaced by that which is possible yet distant and that which seems impossible yet is attainable. So the political overtones are quite, quite evident. The world of philosophy is the universe of worlds. Its philosophical tenets are experimentations in crafting worlds and their intelligence inhabitants, which upon careful analysis can be shown to consist of one world and one universal conception of intelligence. So he's kind of uh, aligning, you know, world making, the plurality of worlds that we get from Goodman and the things I was talking about in the course, the forms of life to this one idea, overarching historical thesis, right, philosophical thesis, not a political one, but which has these political overtones and some, some indications as to how to bring this about, uh, which is more, uh, you can get more of it in the labor of the human in a sense, because it's more practical, I think. Uh, but it's always very the theoretical, like he, in a sense, it is um, proposing a, a set of ways of thinking that are enmeshed with doings, um, but they don't have a defined political political goal, really, other than the pursuit of a good life that he takes from play to here. So, um, okay. To the extent the new worlds of intelligence are not just cognized worlds, they are fundamentally the world recognized in different ways. So, uh, going back to a kind of unification of this of this plurality. So the practical consequence of co oh, sorry, can, can you go back just one second? The last statement I was a bit confused. Uh, so there is it, cognition of worlds is ultimately recognition in different yeah. ways because there is a universe of worlds, right? So yeah, yeah, this is the idea. This is a this is a point. Uh, it's good. It's good you you bring bring that up. I think this is a point. I, I'm not sure. I agree with Reza because the whole point of Goodman was that you can't, you, you didn't really have a universe because you, you can't really have a, you don't really have a, a, a one thing that is behind the way you cognize a world. Like you can cognize and recognize and uh, the, the um, disambiguation is not made by, by appeal to an underlying reality, which is which would be only another way of describing the thing. You know? So uh, I think the way he 
uh, compatibilizes this universalism with this kind of uh, what Goodman calls a relativism under rigorous, re rigorous restraints uh, is through history, really. Like the universal world is that which is unfolding, uh, like the exteriorization of intelligence in history that is producing all these different ways. So it's not really one specific world that is underlying this, but it's this process in, in a sense, the, 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 the pursuit of the intelligible in a sense. So I think this is the way that he is compatibilizing. It's not really, so he's kind of escaping Woodman's, uh, Woodman's uh, stricture by not appealing to one uh, time slice, specific time slice of a world, and instead to appealing to this, appealing to this uh, dynamic process of extracting, extracting intelligibilities, you know, from whatever worlds that might come about through thinking or through doing, as well. So this is the way I understand it. Very good. Uh, practical consequence of upholding thought. So. Now we approach the, the practical problem. So we have here a, a couple of things. This is the most important, uh, I think one of the most important uh, quotes is from the labor of the human. Then we get the actual model. I was going to present this in the last, uh, last uh, presentation, this random, uh, random model of uh, practical elaboration of abilities. Um, but I will do it today and then I'll get to Marx and our friend. <laughs> okay, so uh, now, now I want to, now this is too long, just a datum five. So in datum five, the issue of the concretization of thoughts ramified path is explicitly approached. I, uh, yeah, whatever. So datum five, thought and the artifact. By reformatting thinking from a byproduct of material and social organization into a programmatic normative enterprise. So he's taking into account the fact that thinking is something that emerges out of you know social and material organization, but it bootstraps itself into a programmatic normative thing, right? So it is trying already to, to make sense of this relationship between sheer regularity and you know pattern governed behavior and the emergence the objectivization objectification of these patterns into norms that are to be elaborated so uh, that rigorous inquires into its operational and constructive possibilities philosophy introduces a vision of the artificial into the practice of thinking rather than a thought that is simply accustomed to the use of artifacts and has a concept of artificiality, it is a thought that is itself a practice of artificialization and becomes the artifact of its own end. So uh, this, this bootstrapping process, you know, it has to do with a kind of reflection and this reflection is taking thought itself by its object of, of elaboration. One, once thought is thought, which is also a doing, is reflecting upon itself, this, this uh, enables different forms of thinkings and doing uh, uh, algorithmically elaborated out of them. So, however, in order for thinking to examine its possible realizabilities, it must first establish its inherent tractability to the process of artificialization. That is the first step is to show that thinking is not an ineffable thing, but an activity or a function, special but not supernatural, and that it can be programmed, repurposed, and turned into an enterprise for the design of agency, which is, I think, the core practical thesis here, in the sense that every step in the pursuit of this enterprise will have far-reaching consequences for the structure of the agency that uses it. This has a kind of interesting Spinozistic overtone as well, like in the sense of, uh, uh, augmenting your potency, the potency to act of each mode, right? Which is also something that Tony Negri gets and uh, this kind of accelerationist tradition is thinking about uh, the commons in that way, in a sense, this distribution of potency. Really. So uh, the design of agency has something to do with that, like the, the, positive, the space of positive freedom, one can 
conquer for itself by redesigning, you know, thinking and doing. Because to redesign thinking, to redesign thought is in a sense redesign uh, action. But as we, as I said, this is still this is still limited by the theoretical way of uh, theoretical way of thinking about it. Right? It's not really thematizing uh, concrete problems of organization, anything like that. It's just like a framework in order to uh, think about this augmenting of capacities. Uh, okay, la, la, la. Uh, this is can skip. So in the labor of inhuman, it still wasn't about philosophy as a program for the development of intelligence, but the elaboration of the contents of human that included the augmentation provided by AI and the pursuit of freedom in the functional sense. Thought in this way, this has more political traction. In a sense, a functional, this is a quote, this is from the labor of inhuman. In a sense, a functional organization can be interpreted as a complex hierarchical system of functional links and functional properties related to both normative and causal functioning. It is able to convert, this is important, it is able to convert the given order of is into the intervening and enable order of ought, where contingently posited natural limits are substituted by necessary but revisable normative constraints. It is crucial to note that construction proceeds under normative constraints, not natural constraints and natural determinations, hence realism, that cannot be taken as foundational limits. Functional hierarchies take on the role of ladders or bootstraps through which one causal casual fabric is appropriated. I think it's causal. Yeah, there was an automatic correction here. Causal fabric is appropriated to another. One normative status is pushed to another level. So in a sense, it's like, uh, it's really this intervening attitude is it's a kind of inseparable from natural regularity, but, but it, is a, it is a kind of a, uh, acknowledging of this natural regularity that makes it a norm that is prone for elaboration in a sense. Because of that, I was, I was answering to Yasha in the beginning, because of this, this, this you know, so large and gap between regularities and the way they get enmeshed in uh, functional normative description. Right? But, but if I understood it correctly, just, just to go back there a bit, in the, in the middle, it said uh, functional organization, a complex hierarchical system of functional links. It is able to convert the given order of is into the intervening and enabling order of all. So it seems like functional organization turns, and like it's denaturalizing in the sense that it turns things that appear to merely be a given into things that are actually uh, acknowledged. They're requiring a, a normative commitment, right? Yeah, you, you integrate the is, like you have to have this, in, in this kind of philosophy, you have to have this, this layer, right? You have to have like natural regularities. It's all about, it's, it's, it's really kind of a, it's really kind of a, both a communization and a linguisticization of the Kantian insight that you know um, you are determined by natural compulsion, but at the same time you are acknowledging this natural compulsion. While acknowledging this natural compulsion, you are able to build upon it in a sense. Um, so it's not it's not really an account. There's a there's a whole tutorial problem there. I mean that has to do with the problem of freedom and all that. It is a kind of a compatibilist account that is trying to compatibilize determin determin determinism and freedom in a sense. Uh, and this compatibilization goes through the idea that uh, you you kind of have to acknowledge that which is unavoidable. Uh, as a regular determination, and in, uh, in, there is no ontological difference between a natural regularity in, you know, what you take to be uh, a not or a normative dimension. It's, they are both in the same place, so to speak, a logical, logical place, but the, the dimension of the ought, the dimension of taking it as a norm, 
uh, in, in a sense makes it prone to normative elaboration. Like if you if you are able to re-describe it in terms of normative ought, uh, you are objectifying this regularity in a sense that you can re-describe it and and uh, 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 elaborate a different set of norms with it. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting because, uh, I mean, we can discuss this a bit more later, but uh, there is the, the inverse. I, I feel like there is an inherently problematic or, or, or sort of negative judgment of the inverse path of going from ought to is, because it implies like naturalizing something that is yeah. artificial and things like that. But at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because that's pretty much the, 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 in my opinion, the more Hegelian take on things, which is you can only bootstrap yourself on a norm that you can treat as a being. Meaning, mm -hmm. if, if you if you treat the norm as a as a you know it, it's just an ought it can be the, it could be otherwise you don't get to to the otherwise because it it remains just a sort of virtual other thing whereas it's interesting that also it, the Badius project could be in a I mean not in a naive sense not about naturalizing things but it's pretty much about going from ought to is. Right, it's going from this ought to be the case to the to constructing the situation where you can say this is the case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's kind of his definition of novelty, something that is irreversible in the sense that uh, it, it was not, now it is, and it was mediated by a normative generic. Yeah, but in a sense, it's in a sense the same thing, right? Because in the labor of being human. The idea is that uh, this bootstrap is is, is uh, severing the links between you know, the 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 way things are now and the way the, the human will be will be presented in the future. In a yeah, but my, my question to you then is the following: Don't you feel that there is a sort of underlying decision or or preference to to treat you 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 are in the in the most free and most rich situation, the more everything looks like a revisable norm, mm -hmm. right? Directly looks like a revisable norm. I mean, not that it could be revised because, I don't know, things that I think are not norms might be revisable. I don't mean, but like, it's almost not in the sense of the actual construction, but how you evaluate where you stand in it, mm -hmm. right? Which I feel like it's very, very, a very virtuous philosophical standpoint where the more things appear as contingent the more they are contingent something like that whereas uh there is something about an alternative more political like the political question of of, of change usually thought of what can we do that cannot be taken back right but, which i think is something it's like what is this irreversible systemic change in such a way that uh, what we ought to do becomes a situation, what is, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas it seems like philosophically, you want to go the other way around. Everything that is should be filtered through I see, sort of I see. normative analysis, and we will evaluate that we've moved forward because things look more contingent, right? Whereas that politically, that's not necessarily the best measuring stick. Even if that's, it's still possible philosophically to make that analysis. It's not a, it's not a necessary choice, but I think it yeah, says something. It's like it's like a, it's like a difference be, between the political perspective and the philosophical perspective. Yeah, I think you could capture it's something, something like about it. It. Yeah, something like this. Like it is useful for the political. It's, it's kind of it's almost like an as if argument. Like it's useful for political action in a sense. If philosophically you you act as if everything is revisable, while in direct political action, you want to ensure that it is not. Yeah. Something like this. Yeah. Like some, and, some and, the, and, yeah and the game between the two gives a nice sort yeah. of 
feeling, a more solid feeling to this bootstrapping because I want to revise something yeah, right. and yeah. arrive at a consequence that then it's so yeah. solid I can step on it to revise something else, yeah. right? It doesn't yeah. give you this yeah. feeling yeah. of all possible yeah, worlds. I see. I see yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, I don't really get this feeling, I think, because um, I see I, uh, you are also, uh, it's good because I, I'm also getting what you're, what kind of aspect you're, you're getting out of the text, which is which is good because part of my difficulty, I, I'll say that because part of my difficulty in exposing this to, a, I mean, an audience that is not, you know, um, that is not uh, uh, accustomed to, you know, this kind of uh, post-pragmatist philosophical language, this kind of thing, is that uh, these terms are very charged, effectively charged. So. When you when you talk about you know norms, people are more, you know, oh my God, you are you are you are in favor of the norm of the normal of what is. So it's kind of the opposite of what you're saying. The usual the usual reaction I get is the is the, is the opposite one. But yeah, well, I, I think, think you established very clearly that yeah. rule rule obeying behavior is behavior that could be otherwise. Right, it could be otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that was, the the big point. Right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I went over to that because <laughs> of, yeah, you see, because I, I had, I had, I had always the expectation that somebody will say, oh, you are refining things. You want things to be normal. You want things to be just one way, the correct and the incorrect. No, the correct and the, and the incorrect are model, you know, modally instantiated uh, uh, judgments, right? Like you can be correct and incorrect regarding different, very different rules are very different norms. So yes, this is this is the kind of interesting thing that is that there's a kind of constraint going on because there is a determinacy going on. It's not not anything goes, but at the same time it's a determinacy that is uh, one step one step uh, further from natural determination in a sense. You have to have natural determination as this you know ooh, original determination like something that you have to build upon. Right, even our material constitution, everything, but uh, with the, with the, with the con constitution of norms, you can get you can get different within the space of affordances. That is, that is uh, also uh, constrained by you know the way things are, but you 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 have a space of elaboration with that within that. But yes, uh, I don't get much of that sense because. For instance, I, I come at least philosophically, not politically, but philosophically, I, co I come from, you know, Wittgensteinian uh, kind of philosophy, and uh, in Wittgenstein, you, you already you already have that the, the whole talk of the re the way things are and how rigid they seem, but Wittgenstein is always saying that this is an this is a problem of grammar, so uh, like you can have. Uh, Kind of recipe, uh, intellectual recipe, when you have where you have like necessity and rigidity. At the same time, this is invented. This is not something given by metaphysical determination or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And this is the whole point. I mean, maybe the, the most the most uh, the most crucial point of you know what Einstein was trying to do, which was trying to uh, uh, bypass the need for, you know, uh, metaphysical explanations. And uh, then he's, he's, he's always uh, uh, differing to rules and forms of life and the way we are subjected by, by them in a sense. So we, we are so constitutively determined by them. So the, 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 issue, the issue of revising is difficult. It's not, it's not that it is easy to revise. Oh, yeah. Really. Yeah, it is possible to revise, but it's not that it's easy. This is this is a different thing. So you have to modalize a little bit this this kind of this kind of thought. No, but, but I understand it better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. So this 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 is not giving one measure of how easy it is. It is. It's just giving. It's just saying that it that it is not absolute. No, yeah, but but I also I mean I'm I'm also saying that it was a measure of easiness or something like this, but just the idea that. We are evaluating what counts. I mean, because from what I understood from *Labor of the Inhuman*, one of the big ideas of the text is that there is this 
small move, like this very basic movement from commitment to the human is taking your commitments beyond their natural. Beyond the human, even. Yeah, yes. exactly. Beyond their, let's say, their immediate yeah. sort of realm. They, they their to, they to, outer they consequence. To, stage one, stage zero. Yeah. Stage zero is a human, but you have to elaborate beyond that. Yeah. And, but then that makes it almost like, the, which is, a, I mean, I, he's fully aware that it's a sort of very classic enlightenment thesis of the sort of yeah. self determination To be a human is to self determinate what it means to be a human. But he gives it a very sophisticated kind of uh, machinery to what that means. It, it's not reduced to volition. It's not reduced to your opinions, to your self. So it, it kind of distinguishes self-determination of humanity from doing what humans feel like doing, right? Yeah. Because there's this sort of very imposing uh, kind of a violence of, of reason. Yeah, it's like, it's, like, it's like humans can do a lot of different things that they want to do. But only some of those things count as elaborating the commitment to hum to the human, <laughs> which is the basic idea. Yeah, no, no, I, I get that. But my point is that once you establish that, you kind of want to know what it means to go to a better place, as as you had there as one of the of the basic truth candidates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems that we have the criteria for evaluating what this better means by the sort of by this machinery of turning is to us. Right. Well, the more is became us, mm -hmm. the more we are in this better position, because the more revisable I'd say, I'd, things I'd, are. I'd say, yeah, I'd say it's not giving the criterion of the better. It's 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 giving the um, mechanism for achieving the better. But I'm not sure. Uh, this is a, this is a quibble I have. I'm not sure that you know elaboration of the human gives you a clear cut path you know like like an objective like a goal mm -hmm. like in a criterion of what counts as the better so yeah in a sense you are right because not not because there is a criterion but because there isn't one yeah i mean so this because, is very because you don't have a criterion of what what is the better it befalls on the revisability itself yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, yeah I, mean, I think it's, yeah, this it's classic I mean, I think, Hegelian yeah. territory of yeah, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. people thought self-determination was an easy, nice thing, and then you start reading, reading philosophy of yeah. right, and you know, yeah. you can <laughs> see that you, you fall into all the sort of paradoxes of willing your the, the willing the free will is a will that wills itself free, and then you get into this weird contingency necessity. And I mean, I, I get the, the where we are, but. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand because functional organization with system of functional links and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's a lot of stuff. And I wanted to see, okay, what, how do we know what this is, you know, uh, moving? Because just, just to give a counter example, for example, uh, there is an alternative reading of Hegel where the focus was perhaps more romantically, but I'm not sure. Uh, on the idea that, well, a, a social formation tries to accomplish something in its own image, it fails, and that failure contains something of the truth of that social formation, right? Uh, so it's relevant information, not only for the future, but for what happened. And uh, therefore, there is this very important connection between negativity and truth and, and construction, right? Uh, but the emphasis in this situation is not in spirit as the self-revising mechanism, but in spirit as that negative point, right? It's like a failure. It's like, like a like critical the, point. It's yeah. like an impossible point, right? Like the failure. The failure itself is the access that gets assembled as spirit, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. So the internal structure yeah. of the failure is yeah. more structured. Than the social formation that produced, right? Uh, yeah. Which gives it the whole the whole reading where negativity is very central. Spirit is the, like the reason in spirit is the opposite of rationality in society, because reason only appears as the sort of irrational, as what is irrational for society. And here it seems like revision is a name for reconciliation that seems more. Harmonious, in a, I mean, very laboring, very la laborious, but also more 
capable of reabsorbing what it does, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. This is this is built upon the you know the Brandomian framework. So no, no, but I want to tell you if let's say you see that my point. Like for example, uh, just to give a very concrete example, some political orientation will say that if we today have a good leftist government, the best it can do is to create an uncontrollable political riot against itself because yeah. it will have to create conditions for people to express their rage, which is like long time coming and it's probably going to lead to its own catastrophe. It's not going to be able to reintegrate this into itself. It's going to be like a disruption of its, its own path, right? And you could say that alternatively that no, the best leftist thing to do today or, or a better criteria of success is the capacity to reintegrate this revolt into itself, right? Mm -hmm. So those are slightly two different criteria of evaluating what reason is in those cases. Is it the Maoist one where it is rational to revolt against reason, right? Good leftist reason, progressive, populist, accelerationist reason, or, mm -hmm. you know, no, the moment that you, you kind of skim off the path into something that is not socializable, recognizable, you're kind of running away from it. You know, like, there's a, two ways of interpreting the relation between reason and negativity that I think this example shows to how it could diverge, you know? Yeah, yeah, it does show... It does show in yeah, but I, I'm 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 always thinking that that might be also can can be compatibilized. I mean, in the second order, but uh, yeah, maybe it's no. Just I, too I, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would love to see a, a, a Maoist version of, of of this because then you can ask, of course, like what is the internal social cohesion yeah. of this. Yeah, but yeah. at least I think it shows the, that there is a decision, you know, in terms of how you evaluate what you call the sort of rational self revelation Yeah, I think, I, th I think one possible answer to this, I mean, is to, to say that it is not prejudging how the revision will go about necessarily. Mm -hmm. So it's not prejudging the, the specific way it can, it can, it can, it can assume it can it can assume a very hostile form, a very violent form, so within the same process, in a sense. So it, it is thinkable, for instance, that uh, I don't know we there is there is a there is a, an uprising because of a certain commitment to a certain idea or a certain uh, a certain kind of society that embodies a certain idea that is thinkable within these, you know, these, these sequence, for instance. And then you, ha you have like a local rupture that can be, that can be uh, appropriated through a sequence as well, in a sense. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this is, like, I, I see what you mean. Like it's in the, in the first, in the first order, it is different. But I think maybe they both can be. Can no, be yeah, I, mean, I, I don't feel that yeah. this is like a, a yeah. reconcilable yeah. point, but it does feel yeah. like it's two slightly different starting points. And I feel like yeah. it was very important issue in the 60s because like for, for Marxist French thought, that was the trauma, like the big event they want. Like they didn't know much about China from what we, like retrospectively looking at what they were saying, they probably didn't know much. But they understood one thing that they thought was happening there, which is the Chinese Communist Party got to power and the consequence of the left being in power and coming up with a revolution was a revolution against the Communist Party. So that's not a reactive movement. That's a revolutionary consequence of its own success. And that was a sort of new idea on the table. So what about dialectics? If a dialectical movement can lead to a rupture with its own dialectic, yeah, yeah. like that sort of crazy thing, you know? Yeah, no, I, see, I understand. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well. Anyway, let, let's let, let, don't want to take too much. I, I just need one second. We'll be right back. Okay.
So any more questions? Uh, I had a question. So do you, do you think it's valid to, or, or do you think it's reductive to consider normative constraints as being something akin to a set of measures um, for given phenomena? Like, you know, I was just thinking like the, the choice of ruler for something determines the limits of what you, you can express ought to be for that thing, right? Yeah. And not, not simply in a quantitative sense, but just like in, yeah, no, in the sense of, yeah, yeah, of comparison, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think there is something to that. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, there is an account that has a lot to do with that, which is the Wittgensteinian one. Like the Wittgensteinian one is like, norm is a kind of criterion. And because it is a kind of criterion, it's a kind of measure in a sense. Mm -hmm. So one of the very interesting Wittgensteinian insights is that, for instance, you know the Parisian meter, like the piece of whatever wood that is in Paris that is the criterion for the metrical system, for the meter, right? Yeah. So yeah, Wittgenstein says that, is it possible to ask that that has one meter? No, he says no, because that's the criterion by which we say something has one meter. So it is kind of invalid for him to, to apply, you know, the criterion to the criterion itself, in a sense. So uh, it, it has to do with the fact that the Parisian meter is in a place in our understanding that is akin to what he calls like a grammatical proposition. There are propositions that appear to be uh, empirical. They appear to be describing things, but they are actually uh, enunciating rules about how to use their components, right? The component that, that's the, the, the singular terms that are in the phrase. So uh, this is quite interesting. Like there is a whole, and it's quite, it's a quite interesting philosophical endeavor to try to trace like uh, a bunch of these grammatical propositions, you know. And in his last writings, like in uncertain, uncertainty against uh, Moore, Moore, the analytic philosopher, he was trying to give an account of the reality of the external world by giving a list of truisms. Like the first, the first phrase in his, in his list was, I know there is a hand here. This was his first phrase. And Wittgenstein is, is, is uh, uh, challenging this by saying, you can't really say you know there's a hand in there because this is actually a criterion for other knowledge, uh, you know, other knowledge, uh, other knowledge uh, assertions. So uh, I know I am in pain. For Wittgenstein, this is an invalid. I cannot know where I, I cannot doubt. If I only can know what I can doubt. If I cannot doubt, it is a rule. So this is quite interesting. Like, it's quite interesting that he's not, he's not really saying that these are not true, but they're saying that they cannot uh, function as Moore wants them to function as, you know. Uh, so in, the, in a sense, like there's an interesting Brazilian philosopher, José Artur Gianotti, that start from a uh, Marxist uh, point of view, his first books are, are, are about, uh, about uh, yeah, it's, it's in the Marxian framework and he's, he's, he's trying to give an account of value after, after, after a point wherein he thinks that Wittgenstein could be useful because of this criterion thing. So the cri Wittgensteinian criterion was, was supposed to be like a more general thing than value as in you know, uh, the Marxian framework which is a, I mean, it's, it's kind of a digressive, but it's, it's interesting. So yes, uh, it can be used like that in a sense. But I think, uh, I, I, I think the Wittgensteinian specific way of doing this uh, does, not, uh, does not lend itself to bootstrapping as much. You can, in Wittgenstein, you can get uh, revision you can get a difference, different grammatical propositions, different criterion, 
but you don't really get algorithmic elaboration out of something like random random things that you, you get, but uh, I'm not sure you do. But yeah, you, sorry, I'm just, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Thinking out loud a lot about what you said. Yeah, it was a huge thing, but but yeah. I what I what I understood there is like, I can almost say that norms are also exceptions in their own functioning, right? Uh, yes. I was yes. thinking also of like uh, time, we can use time to measure the rate of things, but it, it's almost nonsensical to say like how fast is one second, right? Yeah. Like other it's things can, you can say yeah. it's, you know, meters per second or so on, but how many yeah. seconds per second, it's uh, kind of nonsensical. Yeah. Yes, it seems, it seems when you, you, get, you take something as a measure, the measure does not apply to that something that is measuring anymore, something like that, in a sense. It, 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 it begins to, you begin to talk nonsense. In a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I've got a well, question kind of coming yeah. from the other side is, because it seems like uh, Nagarastani links the, um, the process of converting is to ought to a kind of general problematic of catastrophization. And in fact, he seems to kind of almost invoke kind of Benjaminian language at certain points. And, and I'm wondering if that kind of, what, how that relates to the issues Gabriel brought up around the kind of traditional structure of enlightenment and self-determination, because it seems like that particular place of, Ott brings up a question of destabilization and risk. Yes. And then within that, you have an option to, to do better or worse, but it does seem to interrupt a certain teleology of the appearance that seemed to be kind of what Gabriel was concerned about. You mean you you are you think you think that the Reza's account uh, lends itself to Gabriel's uh, description? No, it, it, it's a point of resistance to Gabriel's concern. Is that is that the the space of art brings up is a destabilizing, catastrophizing yeah, process yeah. within yeah. which then the stakes of better and worse become stakes, right? But there isn't. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, and this is similar to like, right, the Ljubljana reading of Hegel, that there isn't a teleology there, right? But mm -hmm. um, insofar as we go with the classic teleological Hegel, that would be the distinction between mm -hmm. a Hegelian reading and what Negro Astani is trying to do here, would be my interpretation. That's why I, I read I read it differently than it seemed like Gabriel was reading it on that. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah no, but I, I, it fits perfectly with my, I, I think you described it better because my point was I, was not teleology, uh, but I think it connects with your with what Ben is asking. We're saying now, Carol, which is uh, there. What I I mean, he sub, I mean, the whole dis discussion on teleology is out of the window because we're talking about. I mean, truth candidates are just contemporary, like modern axiomatics, right? I mean, it's yeah, exactly the same description. Yeah. So I like, established that. I think yeah, I established yeah, 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 yeah. That. But so, so like, like truth can be like, Euclides. Euclides is the axiom. Yeah, Euclides is yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, like, it, it substitutes yeah. teleology for a sort of experimental, uh, test-based kind of mm -hmm. truth candidate approach to 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 things. So that in itself already gives a kind of further reinforces that norms are coming on the opposite side. Oughts are the opposite of, you know, finality, right? Mm. The, the, because there is, because what ought to be could be otherwise, that also implies that there is room for experimentation. It's not a law, right? So uh, it further reinforces that idea. And I see what you mean by catastrophism and everything. But the thing that I always go back to when, when I'm asked the question about how to evaluate this general process is because philosophy, because it is the program, it is also in a position to evaluate this huge mass of developments of, you know, that are un, un, denaturalizing things that look like a given, you know, and we thought that objects went to the, their natural place, then this gravity thing appeared, you know, mm -hmm. So yeah. the things are not that simple, so that you are on the moon. And apparently philosophy is like the shepherd of this process, Con like 
Yeah, in his account it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like enthusiastically, you know, when in doubt, try it out. That seems to be the, the, the slogan, right? Let's try right. stuff and let's go. Okay. But there is the reason why I asked about evaluation, I mean, and is because it connects the two things we were just talking about, the measure and the example I gave of uh, the rational revolt of, against reason, right? Or a revolution that, that begets uh, further development that goes against itself, right? Well, a, a perfectly understandable way of what happened in Brazil in, in June to, to 2013. I mean, it's hard to yeah, say that yeah. the leftist government wasn't important to create some conditions for good and bad, but the whole point was you need to choose. Either the streets are rational or the government is rational, but not both, right? Because it seems like you need to have one measure, right? And if you have a universe of worlds, in some sense, it seems like philosophies in the position to talk about the ultimate measure of what was the enriching of possibilities. Like, and like, what like, you, like you, from the position of philosophy, you could choose between the streets or the government or something like that. Something like this, which is exactly what every conservative Hegelian philosopher has ever done. Like mm -hmm. Kojev picking up the phone, people say there are riots in, in streets in France. He says, yeah, that's all ridiculous. You know, the world spirit is still at, at holding, like nothing has moved intelligence forward. Goodbye. And hang up, you know. Yeah, but but I th I th I, th I think the the axiomatics change this actually really really. Yeah, but I mean, if there is a sort of universe of you know localized uh, truth candidates, and that gives you the sort of general program well, of expansion. I, I, I th I th yeah, I feel I feel we are always <laughs> always touching upon the same issue. I think it's a. It's a big thing. I understand this is it's part of your project. It's a big thing that philosophy gets to say it or not. This is this is a this is a big thing. Like uh, for me, I don't know if the I don't know why. I mean, this is not the there's not so much at stake in saying that it is philosophy or not. I I I think philosophy here is just the name of of the unfolding of the forms of of, of theoretical thinking really. I mean, science is part of this, in a sense. Uh, we, we can, you can understand a lot of different things as part of this. I'm not so sure that it is philosophy that gets to say everything, in a sense. No, so, no, no. I, 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 I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting somewhere. I, I, the point is, uh, there might, I think, in that, in this point of view, that there, there is a certain point of, uh, a certain perspective wherein you could evaluate things that it is not strictly imminent to what's happening on the streets or strictly imminent to what happened on the government or strictly imminent to the truth procedure of politics, but it has to do with the fact that you can talk. Like this is the, you know, this is the really, really the place of philosophy here. Like it's the place of a concept mongering creature as Brandon says, because you're a concept mongering, you are able to describe, you are able to evaluate. So this is the most general, point of view that you get in this kind of philosophy in a sense is that the fact that you are able to to explicitly articulate thought by language and this is kind of I know this is kind of different from what Badiou is trying to to think but I think philosophy is in this place here the place of having a language that that is that is this medium that can uh, cut across a lot of different truth procedures even if the truth procedures are different you still talk about them. You use language when you are articulating them. You use language when you're doing music, when you're doing politics. I think this is this is the point of view in a sense. Of course, uh, maybe this is obscured by you know this grandiose. Reza is also a writer, right? <laughs> like this grandiose kind of account of, of you know the history of philosophy. But I, I I know for a fact, and Reza is talking also about you know not not just the big Western tradition, but you know. He's quoting Chinese philosophy, he's quoting Islam, he's quoting art. So I, I don't think it's that, you know, localized as, you know, uh, the, 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 the responsibility of philosophy per se 
to evaluate. First thing I'd say is that, but the, the, the point I was getting at is the, is, is the position of language really. I think this is something that we have different. We, we, we take it differently in our respective. I yeah, think, I, I don't know. I, I don't see it as a, I really don't see it as a big issue yeah. concerning language. It's just because you mentioned the, 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 the metric issue, the issue of metric, right? And there is a classic uh, problem, a, which is who, who measures yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, who measures the measure? Yeah. Right. Measure what the is measure. the meaning of a measure? Well, that's only a problem in a, a single absolute reference system. That's not a problem when you have many reference systems. I mean, you can just shift it around and have a relative measure of something else, right? Uh, yeah. So, so the problem is the one, really. It's not language, not philosophy, it's a, the, the existence of the one. Might be, yeah. I mean, I don't. Something I really like don't that. have a problem with language, man. Like, I yeah, really want to yeah. get that off the table. No, I, know, I don't think you have a problem. No, now you're reducing. I'm not, I don't think you have a problem with language. You, you see, it's just that I, I, I think uh, language fulfills a different role in the way yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, think yeah. about things and the way you think about things. Oh, of course. Yeah. This is what I'm, I mean. I'm not saying anything like that. Like you have a problem with language or anything like that just uh just uh i mean you can we can get back to this i mean what i'm not really sure i mean i i know from where this comes let, let me I'll, I'll lay my cards i mean this is you know lawrence pontel's account i mean the thing is that uh pontel is this guy this this Everybody thinks he's a German philosopher, but he's like actually Brazilian born philosopher that went to Germany. And uh, he's trying to compatibilize something like the Carnacian account of, you know, linguistic frameworks. So if you are familiar with the debate between Quine and Carnac regarding ontology, like Quine, Quine has this uh, uh, criterion of ontological commitment that has to do with bounded variables, so the bounded variables of your theory correctly regimented that that means you the ones you have to account for as existing in order for the theory to function are the objects that you are uh, accepting in your ontology and Carnap is saying you know actually it doesn't make sense just to to ask whether a or b exist it just exists then it's just like this exists in a specific linguistic framework. So Carnap is this, at that point, it was the second Carnap, like the uh, logical syntax of language, the principle of tolerance. He was this very ecumenical guy that was in favor of testing everything you, you can test using any language you can, you can use and, and seeing the results. So uh, Punto is this, he wants to have at the same time, the Carnapian framework, the idea that you can formalize different universes of discourse. This is Pontus parlance, like localized universe of discourse in, in, in this. It's not really one might one might think that this is this is the same as a scientific theory. It's not like a scientific th theory might be formulated inside a specific universe of discourse. So it's it's something a little bigger than you know one scientific theory and, and things like that. So uh, it's, this is quite rigorous in Punto, but I, I, I won't rehearse here. Maybe I don't really remember actually. But the fact is he wants to compatibilize the fact that he has access to the several different linguistic frameworks. So he has a kind of a f uh, formal ontological relativism, like you can accept these and these entities because of the frameworks you are using, but you have also the framework of frameworks. Like you have to have uh, the organ on, of the construction of frameworks, something like that. So philosophy for Punto is in this place in a sense, like it's the unrestricted universe of discourse. I know for a fact that this comes from Punto, the idea that you can have like a Goodmanian relativism or pluralism at the same time you can have this medium, universal medium of the constitution of these uh, these frameworks, like, and uh, 
I can see the reason for that. Like uh, the next, uh, it's, it's really, 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 you, you're putting me in a, in a very difficult position because, uh, because it's such a big, really big uh, philosophical issue about the two ways you can understand language. And this will be the subject of my next seminar there in the new center. Uh, the language, language as universal medium and language as calculus, right? This is the dichotomy that was put forward by Jaco Hintika and it's pretty useful. Like language as calculus is a localized thing. You don't get, you don't, you don't get, you don't have a universal because it is localized. You can describe the semantics and the pragmatics and the syntax. So Carnap is a is a it's interesting. Interestingly, he's a kind of a proponent of lingua, language as calculus. Language as universal medium is the idea that anything you might come with will be the result of the same, you know, uh, the same formal apparatus in the, you know, in the deep sense. Like they can be expressed locally in different sets, but everywhere you are doing this, you are doing this with this, this one thing language. And this means that semantics as such, not, not localized semantics, but semantics as such is ineffable. You cannot, you cannot do semantics, you cannot do you know, this as a objectified science like of language, you cannot do that because this is the medium wherein you get to construct these things. So what, what I think they are doing is kind of compatibilizing these two things in a sense that you you don't get to you you don't get to you don't get to describe fundamental semantics because you need to have fundamental semantics for 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 describing anything, but you can describe local semantics, like local frameworks you can describe, but they are kind of variations upon a certain deep level, uh, deep le deeper level, you know, uh, uh, resource that cannot be subjected by its own, its own way of, of describing, in a sense. So, of course, this is a enormous detour I took, like uh, we're discussing like now, you know, <laughs> fundamental philosophy of language, but I just wanted to touch upon the idea that uh, is it really philosophy? I mean, this comes from Pontel. Pontel thinks it is philosophy, but philosophy is in the place of this space, logical space, deep logical space that it is unable to describe itself. It's, it is only a means for describing other other thing, other things. So uh, something like that. So what is the position of evaluation? I'll, I'll say this is the position of evaluation. There is an a priori, you know, uh, fundamental level here going on in a sense. But it is not the difference is it is not a world like like Goodman would criticize. It's not a, a ready-made world. No, it's not. A, it's not any world. It's just the unrestricted universe of discourse. It's, it's the logical resources. It's not really a world, specific world with you know concretions and certain uh, assertions that are true are taken to be false in, in such and such domain. No, it's not correlated to to a specific domain in a sense. Like it's the condition for the constitution of formalisms that are correlated to specific domains. Something. Yeah, but you see that this quote you have here it gives a very ambivalent vibe, right? The yeah, world of philosophy is, every, uh, is the universe. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah can be shown to consist of one world and one universal conception of intelligence. It seems like there is a very strong sense of unity, right? But I mean, I understand from what you're saying that it's more complicated than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, just uh, I'm not sure if I'm finishing today. Like, I uh, still have your paper to talk about. Like, it's a lot. Uh, uh, we, we can go up until what time for you guys? Like, what time is good? I think another hour works for me. Like 10, yeah, maybe. But I mean, we can, we can just split it into two, I don't, I mean, for me, it wouldn't be a problem, I think. Yeah, maybe talk a little bit next week, the rest perhaps, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, here's the, just to flesh out a little bit what he means, there is actually a formalism for the, 
practical elaboration of these courses, you know, that, that is put forward by Brandon in between saying and doing. So uh, Brandon devised what he calls meaning use diagrams, which are category theory diagrams that are intended to, for the representation of the relations between what he calls practices and vocabularies. So this is a very simple example, the first example of his book. It's really an interpretation of a, of a uh, commuting uh, diagram, right? Well, so, what is uh, uh, sufficient? That's what BP sufficient. That's the SUL. This is what I'm. While while I'll, I'll, I'll discuss now. Okay. So uh, the thing is, uh, this is what he calls a pragmatic uh, uh, meta vocabulary. So. Uh, which is a pragmatic, a case of a pragmatically mediated semantic relation. So a semantic relation might, might obtain between, you know, a name and a thing or something like that, uh, a, a phrase and a, 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 and a state of things. So, but a, a pragmatically mediated semantic relation is a relationship between one vocabulary and another vocabulary. But it is not, it is not directly through the specification, for instance, of syntax, like one vocabulary is saying, uh, is telling you the meanings, like in a dictionary, the meanings of another vocabulary, something like that. No, the thing is one vocabulary is specifying what you have to do in order to be engaged, engaging in a second vocabulary. So uh, it, it takes into account the, 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 the uh, division between, you know, content and act in every speech act. So uh, here in this, this formalism, he's using, you know, V prime, V prime has this VP sufficiency relation to P, which has a PV sufficiency relation to V. So PV sufficiency is just a, this, this set of practices are sufficient for engaging in this vocabulary. And this vocabulary is sufficient for describing the P the set P of practice, practices that are PV sufficient for another vocabulary, which entails this arrow right here, the resulting arrow that goes from one vocabulary to another, which is the specific relationship of being a pragmatic meta vocabulary. So V prime is a pragmatic meta vocabulary or V because it specifies what you have to do to be saying what P is capable of expressing. So uh, this is the basic basic idea of a meaning use diagram. This kind of, is tracing these, these relationships between different vocabularies. Uh, I quite like this book. It's the, between saying and doing by Brandon. Uh, I think maybe it's a, his, best, his best stuff. Uh, and for instance, as an example that is given by Brandon, uh, it's a, actually a formalization of a specific argument. That's a pragmatic argument that sellers provides, for instance. Um, here you have, for instance, Sellers, uh, one of the chapters of Empiricism and Philosophy of Mind. Uh, Sellers is debating the phenomenalists. That, that, that means that those people who think that uh, you look, look talk, the talk that attributes appearances to things, can be an autonomous discursive uh, an autonomous discursive practice, which means can be a vocabulary you engage in without engaging with any other vocabulary. How, how someone come to defend such a view? Just because the phenomenalists might be, might be uh, thought of like, like, as foundationalists. So the foundation of you know, uh, knowledge, the foundation of knowledge is this uh, layer of appearances that are expressed by looks vocabulary. So if this is a foundation, so this might have might be a, a, an independent vocabulary, right? So this is the basic the, the way Sellers construes the basic uh, the basic uh, argument uh, that some people, for instance, in the Vienna Circle or some some people from phenomenological tradition might uh, might uh, construe construct. Uh, knowledge or apodictic knowledge, in fact. So, this chapter is tries to try to show tries to show that looks vocabulary is actually dependent upon is vocabulary. You have to 
be able to say that something is phi in order to say that it looks phi. You cannot have looks without say, saying is. So uh, I will just gloss over it, right? So uh, it's, a, it's actually a thought, a thought uh, experiment about a guy that is in a shop and he's selling uh, ties and he's, he's saying that somebody asked for a tie of a certain color and he gives a, a wrong tie because the lighting in the place is wrong. And so actually the look of the tie is dependent upon his being able to say what color the tie is actually, is actually, right? Something like that. And, and the, the is talk is dependent upon certain normal conditions of lighting and everything like that. So every talk about the way things are has also its own conditions. Okay. And this, this entail the relationship between looks and is. So this is just the, 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 the Salarzian, Salarzian argument there in EPM. But what, what Brandon is, say, is doing with this is just formalizing in this way, like the argument is actually is not an argument that says that you have to know how things are in order to say how it looks. It says you have to know how to use vocabulary that says how things are in order to say, to use vocabulary that says how things looks like, right? Look like. So here you have like a PP necessary relationship, like you have a certain practice that is a practice of asserting things, how things are, that is necessary for a practice that assert how things look, that is sufficient for a vocabulary that articulates look stock. And this practice P is phi, is PV sufficient for the vocabulary that says how things are. So this entail a relationship between the vocabulary that says how things are and vocabulary that says how things look. So this is, a, for instance, a, just an example of a use of this kind of diagram. So there is this philosophical, it's not really important for us, but there's this philosophical argument and Brandon is showing that it is actually a pragmatic argument. It's not an argument about direct semantic relationship, it's a, 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 an argument about what you need to be doing in order to be engaging in saying this and that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is this is the, this is one use that he can, he can, he can give to his, his diagrams. And uh, now there's a more interesting one, sorry. That is the elaborated explicating condition uh, uh, graph. Of course, there's a lot that I would have to, I'll have to talk a lot about this, how, how you algorithmically elaborate one practice into another. Uh, Brandon goes goes a long way into uh, explaining things like that, but this is just an example, just to make it um, make it uh, intuitive for you guys. So, for instance, here you can you start from this. You have this this thing here, right, which is a a practice that amounts to an autonomous discursive practice (ADP). It's an ADP practice. Like you can have this practice without having any other. The one practice that he thinks is central, and he has an argument for that, is the practice of affirming, asserting, so or describing. Like you have, you can describe, for instance, without using conditionals, without using counterfactuals. You can just say how things are. Okay, so this is a this is the P that is PV necessary for V. And there is a PV sufficiency as well. So it's necessary, both necessary and sufficient for V1, which is an autonomous vocabulary of descriptive vocabulary. There is a subset of this ADP, which is inferring. So in order to, in order to uh, describe, you have to infer, right? You have to say if things, actually you, you, you don't get to say that. You just treat as incompatible a is red and A is blue. You treat them as incompatible, but you do not, you do not say that, you do not say it. You don't say if, you say A is red and you treat it as incompatible with A is blue, okay? So you're still in the vocabulary of uh, assertions. 
But you have this, then you have already everything you need to do to elaborate or make explicit, to make explicit what you are doing when you are treating both A is blue and A is red as incompatible, is this practice here. You need this conditionals. If you just make explicit what you are already doing, and to, you have to algorithmic elaborate a certain set of practices into another that is a kind of reflexive, reflexive, uh, 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 reflexive objectification of what you are doing, you get conditionals, the practice of conditionals that is PV sufficient for the vocabulary of using conditionals, like hypothesizing or things like that. So you're actually, now you can actually say, if A is red, A is not blue. But you couldn't when you were just here, okay? So this is the idea. So this is just a simple example that you can have a, a certain set of abilities that in a sense, just by making explicit what uh, you don't get to say it, you, you, you can't really say it, but you already have everything you need to do in order to elaborate the practice that we will enable you to say what you were doing when you were doing what you were doing. <laughs> really something like that. So. This is the thing. So you get this, you elaborate into this. This is sufficient for the vocabulary of conditional. And then you get the arrow that comes back to inferring. Now you can, you can make explicit inferring, right? And you have also, of course, the composition. So I think it's quite interesting. Uh, of course, uh, there would be a lot to unpack there. For instance, one question that get asked, asked for me all the time when I present this, oh, what is the practice? that is separated from the vocabulary, that is the condition for the vocabulary. Yes, this is an issue. It's almost like you have to, you have to, they are kind of um, distinct, but in the componible. Like you have to think of a vocabulary is always paired with a PV sufficient practice for it, right? So you don't really get to describe the practice without the vocabulary. This, this is one of the issues of this, this framework, right? But I a question. It, sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, John. Sorry, uh, somebody was, uh, there are two questions at the same, same time. <laughs> Go, John. I'll just shoot. Uh, my question was so when he's talking about inferring prior to conditions, is he talking abductive then? And like the pragmatic abductive or what? Yeah, the, like, 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 it's like a treating. You, you, is, is, the issue is are, do you have just with this vocabulary the way to express? Uh, express the structure of the inference. No, you don't have. You only do it. This is the idea. Like, you, in order to engage in descriptive practice, you have to treat some uh, utterances as incompatible, right? But it is thinkable that you are able to do this, even if you are not able to make explicit the rule by which you do this, mm -hmm. right? So this is, this is the idea. So you can infer that because it is red, it is not blue, because you will treat those in practice. You'll treat those sentences as incompatible. When you say it is blue, you won't say it is red. It's oh. just that. But you, you don't know how. Let's, let's imagine you don't know how to make explicit this inference. So okay. they're acts of inference in a way. Acts right? of inference, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So then you, by elaborating a piece of, vocabulary out of what you already have by in a sense it is already present you already do it but you don't express it so in a sense he, this is a kind of a bootstrapping of course there's a story to be told because he's also treating syntax in this book in this uh, uh lx thing the p all gel you're seeing this like p all gel like mm -hmm. a practice of algorithmic elaboration out of inferring into conditional okay which is PP sufficient for this. So of course, there's a story, story to be told here. So, but if you, if you are interested, I can prepare something specialized, <laughs> okay? So there's a story to be told here, of course. But yeah, the, the, thing is, sure. the thing is, you, you already do what you need to be describing, okay? So in a sense, it is already here. You just need to have the expressive ability to make it explicit so you have conditionals that in turn describe what you are doing here in the first place. And, and it gets, of course, uh, 
composition here because it becomes sufficient, uh, it becomes uh, necessary and sufficient for this of also. It was embedded back into the autonomous discursive practice. Okay, so this is this is the basic idea. I mean, uh, what was the yeah, yeah, this this was John John's question. Sorry, I, sometimes I get too caught up in my own presentation. So sorry, but yeah, it was John's John's question. Yes, so in a sense, you are you you just you do it, you do it without expressing it by algorithmically elaborating a certain set of practices, common vocabularies. You get to express what you were doing. So this is a model of, for instance, functional bootstrapping, like. That, that stuff that Reza was saying, like, oh, you can, from a set of a set of functional abilities, elaborate another set of functional abilities. This is not just just saying, like there is there's there's some some ways of, of approaching this. Of course, this is very coarse grained just to introduce this the, the issue, uh, but there is some ways of approaching this kind of relationship between vocabularies and when where wherein you get this kind of uh, uh, mutual elaborations and this dynamic dynamics of functional bootstrapping from one vocabulary to another. So this is just a, uh, an instance of that. People are thinking. No, I think one thing that clarified to me a lot now is why the 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 same guys who are interested in this are interested in the whole Girard thing with. Transcendental yeah. syntax and yeah, weird exactly. stuff that I like, totally like the, go the over my head. Thing, yeah, the Shihar thing is like the deep structure of this, like even deeper. Like this is just, you know, you have already you have already syntax and you pragmatically elaborate from from a certain set of 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 syntax, uh, syntactic semantic abilities, but with the uh, with the uh, Girard uh, framework. You get to uh, you get to construct syntax out of pragmatics. Like you have a minimal set of rules, pragmatic rules of dialogical uh, mm -hmm. behavior that gets gets uh, gets uh, compositionally uh, assembled. Right, uh, compositionally assembles sets of you know syntactical uh, constraints, things like that. So it's kind of uh, it's it, it's it wasn't it wasn't really thought about uh, out of jihad. It was kind of independent. Yeah. But now, yeah. Now people are 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 mixing these these two things because they they go they go very well together. Uh, jihad is almost giving you the deep syntax of of this kind of thing, really. And 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 Reza says talks about it. I mean, John just got the intelligence and spirit. Chapter seven is about this. Chapter seven is about, uses the Girardian scheme in order to construct this kind of thing, the Brandomian scheme. You kind of construct constructing the Brandomian scheme out of the Girardian Girardian uh, logic, which is quite interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, but it also gives. I mean, from a very naive. I mean, I've tried to read Girard a couple of times. I totally yeah, same in my head, but I, I, I'm, I'm not claiming I understand Girard. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I I go as far as understanding like the different infernos that he described. I mean, he has the weirdest writing style. He's so French. Yeah, he's French. Uh, yeah, and, and he talks about, okay, you have like this truth value dimension, then you have this sort of modeling dimension, then you have this sort yeah. of very deeper uh, structure, but it's still like a sort of pure synthetical approach. And then below that sort of proof structure of cut elimination, whatever structures you have, yeah. that sort of Unthematized field of logic, which is the formatting part, right? Which yeah. is the thing. But from what I understand, that implies that what we're calling practices here no longer can be treated as a primitive if you're interested in connecting the two, right? Mm -hmm. But if a practice implies that some things are already left out of the picture, right? There yeah. is yeah. Yeah. below the rule of the, the game, there is the same the underlying rule of how you exclude certain. Yeah, certain yeah, formations, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. Yeah. So it, it turns like from the perspective of of that project of properly accounting for the procedure through which you establish what is a well-formed statement and the basic syntax of a certain system and what is kind of 
he gives a metaphor of sort of the ontics of logics, which would be cases where certain actors are removed from possible judgment, right? It's not even a matter of negated inside a system. It's like excluded from the beginning, but there is a logic to this exclusion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, yeah, it's, um, it's a blind spot of the Brandomian framework as well. Like, uh, for instance, one of, the, one of the problems, yeah, you can construct the practice, but I'm not sure you can have um, also Girardian uh, framework without some kind of concept of practice because the beginning is a dialogical from what i understand you you have a, a set of rules right between two like two model agents. yeah it's an interactional so thing, gives, right? uh, it's an interactional paradigm one 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 gives you rather trying to he's, he's already mixing the things so he says one gives you a reason so the other is consuming the reason so you have a Producer and consumer of reasons. So yeah, but that that, that that's in Girard, I think. Yeah, Girard yeah. uses like weird metaphors that are very yeah, yeah. Producing and consuming is in in there. I don't remember if reason is already there, but it's it's like a producing. You're producing something, and every resource you're producing it gets consumed, and you cannot use it again. Like this is this is one of the basic uh, rules. So you have a kind of a ur practice, right? You have like a, an interactive approach, like you have. A, a certain kind of practice. So the idea of semantics, uh, full-fledged semantics and full-fledged uh, uh, syntax gets... Now you, uh, you, you, you're you forcing me to, to explain this. I don't want to explain this because I don't really have the, 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 a good grasp of it yet. But the fact is, uh, by these, these successive stages of producing and consuming, you get composition of certain... Um, of certain uh, moves mm -hmm. that that you recognize as okay, this is this is like the relationship of reference almost. It's it's quite it's quite uncanny, really. I I don't really have the means to to explain it now. No, but, but, it's but quite the only thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I mean, Girard makes a lot of kind of resource metaphors, right? He says it's logic yeah. for food and things like this. And what you start looking is that it's it's a, it's very much like Marx turning Hegel on his head because it's an econo economical view of reason yeah. and not a state view of reason. If we call the space of reasons the state of reasons, which I think mm -hmm. it's almost the way that these guys treat it, honestly, like mm -hmm. there is this sort of establishment of a field of rationality which posits what is universality for a given period, then it goes to it crumbles under the pressure of spirit and a new is developed that's the concept of state you know and marx conditioned the state on the economy he says yeah fuck your rationality if you don't have like the means to sustain it those means will constrain this sort of state law-like appearance right mm -hmm. and it's interesting that there is a sort of very legal normative approach with Brandon. It's very much like practices and the norms and, and if they are bound together, not bound together, it's very plastic, but it sounds a lot like Hegel talking about the civil society's free wheeling and its practices, in, but it's, it's constant need to come up with a sort of normative dimension to its own uh, practices and so on. And Marx, including this weird kind of inferno like straight i mean he even call it an inferno as well you know which constrains the actual means to come up with the rules right mm -hmm. so there there might be a nice uh parallel yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah let's see well yeah um i i'm not sure if i want to proceed today because i think it will take at least another hour so yeah just just choose the, the i mean people said it's okay to continue next time you could just choose what you think it's a good cutting point i think this is a good cut because i'll i'll get i'll i'll, I'll start your stuff i'll start okay. with the mark quote and then this you know to pin and bus text is in many respects a meditation upon such reverse <laughs> this is the, the rest of, of it so i think it's a good point to to begin next time 
I, I don't know what you guys want to do if you want to. I have because a lot of questions. Postponing I mean, a lot the, the, the Bogdanov. If you want to do the Bogdanov next week, I do two weeks from now, the, the rest, or we postpone the Bogdanov, Bogdanov again. I don't know what you uh, want We to can do. talk about it on, on the group there and see. Yeah, okay. Some people already left and things like this. But okay. I mean, I still have some questions. So perhaps, I mean, we can still use the time if you're up for it. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Because for I was example, just going to ask if you have a, a preference because I'd prefer to keep going directly, but I don't know if how your time schedule is for. Oh, I can do it. It's, it's ready. The stuff is ready. I mean, for me, it's okay. But it's it's mainly if, if anybody wants really want to pursue continue the Bogdanov, I'm I'm okay with it as well. I can do it in two weeks as well. For me, okay. yeah. Let's see what people say. I mean, I I would prefer to continue straight on as well. Okay. okay. But let's see. But one, one thing that I wanted to ask you is that, I mean, I think I spoke to Pedro about this a while back. And uh, I have the impression that uh, that this that this approach is, it's like, uh, it's very clearly concerned. And in the labor of the human text is constantly going back to this idea of, I mean, you can't only have some principles and need to have almost like the infrastructure to update these principles. And you have this sort of, uh, yeah. which I think goes all the way to this, to, I mean, it's, it seems to infuse every step of what you're presenting, which I think is a very, very interesting, very important idea, uh, which is, let's say, you, but, but I would say it's very functionally presented, which is, uh, if reason is this constant revising process of its own commitments in an experimental, pragmatic sense, it's very sophisticated. But at the same time, uh, it seems like there are several kind of uh, parts to this mechanism, right? For example, when he says, well, we have this multi-layered, hierarchical, complex, functional organization and need to be able to update it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's weird what makes me kind of confused is that on the one hand, it seems to take into consideration, let's say, that none of these parts can be abstract or can be, can be removed, meaning you need some updating procedure. It's not automatic. It's not a given, right? So by removing the given from everything, it makes explicit all the sort of cogs you need to connect. Yeah, but the weird, which I think is the best part of it all, like it, you can you can kind of have a toy version of what it means to revise something. And you can see that all the, the philosophers and all the ideas that are coming together are concerned with explicitating this whole process and every step in it, right? Yeah. What does it mean yeah. to say something, it's presupposing this practice and I've got an entailment between practices. And then, well, if you want to revise this, you need to have a lot of particular uh, cogs in place so that this can even be revised and so on. So on the one hand, it seems like it's a, it's a lot of effort goes into making clear that there are many kind of smaller steps that get, get kind of lost in usual philosophical discussion on reflection or self-criticism, yes. which seems like it's the obvious uh, process. So I, I find it on the one hand, very kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very refreshing to see somebody take this sort of classic mechanism of self-reference, which is like the biggest trope in post-war continental philosophy and show that self-reference is actually the gluing of many, 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 many operations, right? I would, I would summarize the project in that way, like yes. intelligence and spirit, meaning, you know, it takes a bunch of stuff. It takes a lot of labor to, re to make yeah. some self-reference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the more it becomes explicit in one way, because it's becoming philosophical, it's philosophically explicit, it's becoming also unified in its kind of conceptually unified you get the feeling that you can see all the if you can see all the parts from one place right uh yeah 
Yeah. You see, that's I think then. that's where the the thing that usually bothers me a bit comes into, into the picture mm -hmm. because the price to pay for rendering all of this explicit at once seems to be to be able to account for it all as in a sort of abstract way that, I mean, my question for you would be, do you feel that this sort of collateral effect, that this is a sort of, this whole philosophical reconstruction of this, uh, doesn't it end up importing into, building into the very framework, some presupposition of something that guarantees that these things cohere together. Like, uh, you know my point, like I've been, when we were talking about that, that kind of theory of organization that I was presenting that I developed with Parana and so on, one thing we were hitting all the time in the sort of, as a, as a serious contemporary problem is that it seems like something shifted socially and philosophy didn't necessarily accompany it. And what shifted socially is that the social heterogeneity between fragments of society are to such a level uh, detached from one another. You can have such a level of atomized social worlds or something like this, because capital doesn't require really their homogeneity, that a lot of politi political philosophy started finding ontological guarantees for the underlying homogeneity of it all. Right, meaning if we do the right thing, things will kind of connect because it's in the nature of X, whatever you want it to be, to connect. So for example, La Cloud will say, if we find the right political catchphrase, yeah, but, the right yeah, but, image, yeah, but, it will connect with everyone. Negri will say, you know, if everyone is resisting against capital, resistance is equal to resistance in some sense, so they will also cohere. Uh, I feel like it's weird to see a philosophy that seems to be ahead of, I mean, even a reaction to all of that. I mean, it's very much a reaction to all the sort of dreamy pseudo-political stuff from the 80s and 90s. It's much more it is. engineering yeah. minded and kind of concrete yeah. in one sense. But at the same time, it seems so unwilling to have a, any sort of in the, in the way that it expresses itself, it's so comfortable with spelling out everything at once and in yeah. presenting this grand picture. It doesn't seem to include the fact that that the terrain is so heterogeneous for this sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, which is exactly what Marx criticizes Hegel for. You know, like. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if you if you had to guess. I don't know. Even if you don't agree, but if you had to suggest somewhere. Where you think this is uh, uh, that, that some sort of presupposition of underlying homogeneity comes into the picture? Where would you kind of suggest it might be? I think I think if we are if we are talking about Reza, it it is the, the final chapter. I think the philosophy of intelligence that I presented because it has the the the, the big political thesis mm -hmm. of the book. So it is in the politics. Because before that, it's not really about politics. It's about constructing a toy model about a transcendental subject, like a, an AI or something. So he's really doing what you what you describe, like putting in place the cogs and oh, you have to have sensibility, you have to have time is interesting, even memory, time, relation, uh, time perception, and uh, intuitive intuitive the contents and all that and then you build upon it a certain form of practical engagements that will emerge eventually as language as full fledged full fledged language and he uses jihad for that so it's all it's it, it has even a, a interesting part about sound a sound synthesis it has like a half a chapter about phonetics how you how in your toy model you put, you know, he, he, he's able to do sounds that will amount to words and everything. And he, he goes out of his way to say, you know, you could have a language that is not comprised of sounds, but I'm using sound because this is what we, we know. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, quite, it's quite sophisticated in that sense. But in the end, I think he wants to build upon it, do a big, you know, political statement in the end. 
that is, of course, it's not fine grained enough. It's too coarse grained. It's it's presupposing this, you know. Uh, it's almost like uh, you're replacing the human from the labor of the human uh, with philosophy. Philosophy is doing this, mm -hmm. this thing. And philosophy is almost, it, it's, it, it's, it's weird because I think from the discussion today, we had like a, a certain, a certain uh, clarity about what does it mean to have axioms or truth candidates. But at the same time, it seems that the fidelity to the concept of intelligence will entail a certain political result. I mean, in due time, even if it's an infinite amount of time, historical time before we get there. So yes, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's there. It's there. I mean, uh, I'm not a left accelerationist. I mean, I, I am very interested in Rez's account of rationality, in Grandom's account, in Seller's account, because I think they they are robust in their own domains. I think. Sufficiently robust. It's not that they don't have blind spots; they do have blind spots. But uh, uh, you know, the political version of it, uh, it seems to, for me, this is always this, this was always the case. For me, it seems to presuppose too fast a uh, 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 practical result out of of this this explanatory framework that has to do with the so so the, the what 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 gets into a constructing a subject, what gets into constructing a rational practice. So it seems this get political too early, too fast. Like, yeah, because there's a big jump from, let's say, yeah. saying I'm constructing a toy model for what intelligent behavior looks like, to saying the history of spirit is the history of the sort of self-intelligibilizing of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. especially because you, you I, that, that's where I think we can kind of restrict it a bit more. And again, I, I don't know enough to, to know if this is in the proper way of formalizing, formulating the problem. But on the one hand, it seems it's a very, I mean, it's following this long trajectory of, you know, the sociality of reason, readings of Hegel, uh, which go from the social to the cognitive subject, right? So you have this sort of, ecology of or a space of reason, right? And then there is a, 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 specific, a more specific version of this, which is okay, the individual as a cognitive subject, you need to match that space of reason in the social category with more specific features of the biological, neurological. Yeah, yeah. Age, like the hardware, you get to the hardware eventually. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> but then, I mean, the fact that you did this uh, doesn't necessarily say anything about, I mean, you, my, my concern is that the statement intelligence is a social concept uh, doesn't entail that what people do with their intelligence is political, right? Yeah. I mean, you can totally, I mean, you can perfectly imagine the sort of, I mean, the internet is a great example of a sort of general yeah depository of ideas that you can yeah. tap into to do shit, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I if this is too, too, too... It's kind of, and it's kind of, it's kind of weird because I, uh, I'm not really sure that Rez uh, um, agrees with his chapter, like, in a sense, like, I think it's very optimistic in a sense, like the last chapter, um, is, is really giving a glimpse of hope for humanity with that, you know, philosophy of intelligence thing. I'm not sure Reza be actually believes it. I mean, it was kind of a, uh, it's not really a logical entailment because you could have the rest of the book without the ending, but uh, it is one version of a certain structure that might result of uh, his views on time and history that are articulated in other parts of the book. But, but, but for uh, example, I really, I really don't think the cash value is there. I mean, yeah, I, I, just, I just it would be wrong to judge it by the last chapter. You mean. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I just took the last chapter because it, it has the political agenda there and it has an interesting relationship to what's in the labor of the human. But I think intelligence and spirit is its own, its own animal, its own project. 
Um, I, for example, let me ask a question that, that connects both books as well, because the transcendental subject in labor of the human is humanity, right? Humanity yeah. works in humanity, and it's not. There are, I even think the word individual might not even appear. Yeah, or, you or, should. You should. Not, it's not that it works; it should work. <laughs> yeah, I you mean, ought, it ought to work. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> the the the, the, yeah. point, the the point of view of the labor of the yeah. human is a sort of it it reads crazily like very early Marx stuff. Mm -hmm. It it sounds like yeah yeah like the the humanities yeah, yeah, yeah exactly it's, it has a lot of those overtones, uh, but intelligence and spirit seems very much concerned with constructing the individual transcendental subject, not the sort of both. TV. I think both. I think yeah, both. but that, that that that's where my question would be: like, mm. are we talking about the sort of transcendental constitution of the space of reason as a sort of the social conditions? of a certain historical moment of reason. And then under these conditions, you have the transcendental constitution of a local individual subject. Or is the transcendental here meaning both things at once? So it's guaranteed because it is transcendental that these two things fit together somehow. Mm, I, think, I think you touched upon the my way of my way of formulating right before the last one. I don't think it guarantees both because it is transcendental, but I think it is both both at once because you can't really have uh, rationality alone. So the thing is, you must have both at the same time, but I'm, I'm not sure this is guaranteed because it is the transcendental. Mm -hmm. You see, like in the order of reasons, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if it is that one. You know why? Because I, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think uh, the first chapter. I'm not, I don't know. You read some of the book, right? Yeah, the first I read chapter them. is Hegel. First chapter is sociality, Brandon, Hegel, blah blah blah, Kant, some Kant, and all that. Second chapter to the seventh chapter is you know the construction of the prime model. So it's this individual thing, and then language gets constructed in the individual thing by interaction. So from the basis, you need sociality. The, the subject is constructed at the same time by, you know, this hardware, biological hardware, and its sociality to the other, to other, other, other of its own kind. No, no, I understand. But, yeah. but it's still, I mean, even if you want to stretch and call it interactional rather than intersubjective, yeah. I mean, yeah. during our presentation, when you, when you, when you were saying, look, but ultimately we're talking about speaking and we speak about a bunch of stuff and philosophy appears as this mediative or elaborative practice because we use the same speech to talk about all these things so fuck it that they're autonomous in whatever sense in, in some sense through the by the fact that we talk they are we are also let's say mixing this whole thing together right yeah, yeah. but that suggests that, but okay but the question who talks well, people who have mouths, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. it, it brings us back to a certain level of, of agency, right? For example, yeah. we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to call, uh, you know, a large social structure a subject because, I mean, in that sense, it it wouldn't, right? It would be lost between. The general mm -hmm. transcendental structure of sociality and the local uh, capacities that a talking subject or talking agent uh, has in that both are constantly kind of correcting each other and so on. But I mean, so that's one thing that I was a bit curious. And the second thing that I think is interesting is that, uh, you know, like you, you, we, you were talking about the impoverished this idea that Evan seems to suggest there is sort of impoverished space of reason, right? Yeah. But there is a nice version of that, uh, which actually, I, I mean, I'm, I, I hate doing this, but perhaps it's a text that has more to do with Rezus than the one that you used. I wrote a text on on a critique of the of Marx's uses of gen generic, which tried to explore this idea, which is that you can have social conditions which impoverish the capacity for estrangement, 
it's literally, I mean, there is a sort of economy of how yeah, much yeah. in humanity yeah. you can participate in. And there are actually, I mean, social conditions for this, right? I mean, you can, you can be impoverished of access to self strangement And it's not a transcendental condition. It's, a, it's, it's in the world historically, right? Uh, our capacity to withstand, like to, to bear being exposed to people who are unintelligible for us mm-hmm. and, that, and to the time that it takes for things to become intelligible. There is a almost quantifiable and definitely pure, poorly distributed aspect to this, right? I remember when Pedro was talking to me about his reading of Red and so on. I remember we we're talking about the connection between kind of actual material bases of technology and how these things actually are responsible for storing in kind of uneven ways these artifacts, right, of reason. All of that kind of helps to, to give a more uneven description of what this social space of reason is. Yeah, it can be yeah. very unevenly distributed. You know, it, it can be constrained by some underlying things. And uh, I don't know, there might be an interesting way to read this sort of impoverished space of reasons that doesn't require you no, to... I mean, I mean, I, 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 I was... Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say something because I was thinking about this just from the start when the when JP said something about our position in relation to, to Justin Evans' text. And I think that it's like recently I've been revisiting some sellers and like at some point, I think it's in um, some thoughts on language games. He, he talks about like how the game of giving and asking for reasons is, uh, is like the meta game that sort of encompasses all games, right? Like, so I think that in our reading of the text, like we're, we, we thought about like how um, how like capitalism would be constraining the game of asking for reasons, I think, but, but it's actually the other way around. And then if you think about it through the other way, well, yeah, it is, it is a kind of impoverished because it's describing a kind of a different game with it, that it's played within the game, right. Of, of giving and asking for reasons. So in that yeah. sense, like, like it's, it's hard to, to figure out through the text, it, through which perspective he does it. Like, if it's like if it's one or the other, but but I think that having like a more like a little bit of distance and and um, and and some more generosity, I guess you would say that w- w- what he's actually saying, and I think he and I, I think about this also in terms to to what we're talking about with uh, with Girard, which is the sort of like <coughs> you're sort of describing a kind of substructural logic of the game of giving and asking for reasons. And I, and I was thinking about this in relation to what Gabriel was saying in, in like, well, like there's no sense of like how like an organization might constitute the subject within like Rezes and, and Brandon and, and Sellers frame. But like, if you think about it, right? Like if you, if you think about it more in the, like in the sort of like the terms of ludics, like you would just have a kind of a process which has like, inputs and outputs right and, and and that if this could be read as some sort of like because i think that that's also the like the more like like algorithmic level you achieve in describing these things more you will see that well yeah like maybe maybe a, a institution is not in the in the sort of like linear logic one input one output but in more like a, a intuitionistic logic which is like several uh, uh, inputs to one input and then you could sort of like maybe get a sense of like how by taking away by like understanding and I think that Reza says this but but it's not like really it, it never gets cashed out in any way which is like there's a difference between the sociability of language of language being instantiated in a social uh, uh, medium and like reason's ability to like implement like rationality in society, right? Like these are like yeah, very, are they're, they're two dis- distinct things that are, but but in, in sort of like in this process of modeling of like computational modeling of these systems, like there, there might be ways of comp- compatibilizing these with like more, 
like diffuse notions of agency and, and, and subjectivity in, in the sense of like, you know, like institutions, organizations, like political bodies and, and so on and so forth. Like it would be like, it, it's totally like batshit crazy, right? Like let's take ludics and think about it in terms of like, you know, massive um, organizational processes. But like, that's sort of like what linear logic is for. Like what, what Gabriel was saying, if like, I, I don't know, if it's in if it's in locus solus or or in the introduction to linear logic, but this this thing of saying like linear logic is for like stuff, like it's actually quite quite truthful, in a weird way. So so like by by like going to this you know like insanely arcane um, reference space, like maybe we can actually draw like way more general things about this, but maybe, because you know, it just like gives like like good tools for conversion, I think. Yeah, I mean, you were the one who actually put me in this path because, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've read like a couple of Jurassic paper. I, I definitely don't follow much, most of it. I do get the sort of cost-based log, uh, sub-logic, whatever you want to call it, uh, approach. And I feel like there is a very clear connection between that <coughs> and another guy who you pointed me to who who talks about bias ration bias rationality you know what, what's the name of the yeah, yeah it's a uh, bounded rationality it's a best moment right i bet simon i think no i think i, I the, the book i read it's called uh, it has a chapter on gossip you know which one it is oh yeah it's uh, it's emmanuel bardon right yes bardon yeah yeah, yeah, no, I think it's it's like this is where a lot of the the things that I work on come from. It's a, it's a lot from Bardon and Lorenzo Maiani as well. Yeah, about I think it's called Seeking Chances. Yeah, Seeking Chances. Yeah, Bias, yeah exactly. rationality and cognitive and, and distributed yeah. cognition, right? And the, yeah. the thing that he does that I like a lot and that connects to the Bogdanov thing we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, because Bogdanov has this he gives two theory two aspects of what working to the cooperation does to resistance, right? The objective version, which is two people lifting a rock together, might lift a rock that is heavier than they could individually lift, something like this. So uh, you can have this sort of objective uh, conjoining of forces, right? But you can also have a subjective one, which he gives a sort of mimetic theory where he says, a worker that imitates another lowers his internal resistance to an, act, an activity because he doesn't need to fully go through the process of decision of what to do. So 10 workers doing the same thing, they, it costs less to think the action because it's distributed amongst all of them, the sort of constant thinking of what they're doing, right? Again, the most stupid example of this could be, let's say, singing a song while they're working. It syncs a rhythm that influences the, the actual task, but it's primary effect is on lowering an internal internal resistance or whatever, right? Uh, and I think that that has a lot of connection with what Bardon is trying to do with this idea that uh, bias is actually can be read as a, uh, a cost-effective distribution of, of commitments, right? Rather than having to work through, let's say, all steps of a certain judgment or a certain uh, uh, process, you can actually uh, reduce that kind of uh, cognitive cost, right? By assuming certain biases that are shared with others, right? That this is not, let's say, pure irreflective preconception. It can actually have some level of, again, revision and correction and so on. So, but it's it's slightly different from what we were seeing before because it's 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 more. I mean, it doesn't have to go like either is like one person or everyone, right? It, it's more mid, okay. mid scale, yeah. right? Because you can talk about, yeah. let's say, hypotheses that prove themselves to lower the, the, the sort of cognitive cost in a region, right? For example, this is something I but, feel all the time, like uh, for, for me to, to maintain certain things, uh, in certain spaces, for example, when I was more like everyday militants in a uh, slum here in Rio, 
it was so co consuming, so cost costly to state certain things, to take certain positions, because you cannot count on a sort of common uh, set of commitments, right? You, you know you sound like an alien, you know like, you, you, so all these things. So compared to elaborating the same things in a place where everyone shares similar commitments and you're allowed to skip a bunch of steps, right? Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a theory of, for example, the poverty of, of a space of reasons, not because anyone is defective, but simply because the heterogeneity requires everything to be made explicit and to be converted in a bunch of different versions of the same commitment because people don't speak the same language. So the statement, let's work together, if you're bringing together uh, Uber workers, uh, uh, militants from two uh, anarchist and communist organizations, and they're meeting together to make that statement, let's work together. You need to say it in three different languages, so to speak. You need to make explicit a bunch of things to show that you're not intending it in another way. So it's ridiculously costly, you know? Whereas if you say the same thing amongst, you know, people who are already your comrades, that's like cost-free, right? So that, I think that's a good example of, you would say that those three, the Uber uh, drivers, the communists and the anarchists are organized because the cost of statements might be lower, right? Uh, so there could be a theory of value of, of proposition. Yeah, the, yeah, the cost. No, there is something like just, because I, I think that this is something like when when Gabriel mentioned the conversation that we had, I think I think I might mention this in in the end, but like in response to what he said, but like with a little less like conscious, it, which is like there's like this difference right between the sort of like like sellers and and Brendan Hegelianism, which is sort of like idealistic in the sense of like of like having a shared language is having shared ideals, and I think Reza falls like directly into this. And I think that like the version that, that I'm working on, um, it has this thing where, w which comes from Mark Wilson, which is like the idea that like, there's no like irrestricted uh, semantic holism. Like we can never be all in agreement about what a term is because like we simply don't have right. the same model of reality, right? And I think that like uh, Mark Wilson, and, and it's like very related to, to Quine, because they have like more of like languages, like cognitive, um, like tools. And I think that like this move from like shared ideals to like shared cognitive tools makes a, a much better sense in thinking about these local restrictions of like the capabilities that, that, that Gabriel was talking just now of, like, of having, um, of having like, you have like a vocabulary and, and like a, a game of giving and asking for reasons or like, reasons which are, are very very well locally defined and like trying to bridge this to like other domains which are also very locally defined like it has like amazing costs for everyone involved like to to understand each other it has like massive massive uh, um massive like costs to, to everyone involved right like and i think that this is like really where like the thing becomes like quite in my in my perspective at least like pragmatic of like how then like knowing all of this helps us with the praxis with the praxis of any kind really of not just like of like yeah being like a person and stuff like that but also you know like organizing to do things together in the world yeah I think it's quite quite striking. It's quite quite interesting that you brought uh, Mark Wilson up. I was going to to do the same because uh, I think uh, this this conversation is almost defined that we have to have a session about it because Wilson actually it's kind of uh, uh, it's one it's it's kind of one steps one, some steps further from from the political implications that we might have. With Sellers and Brandon, because uh, Wilson's main examples are examples of scientific modeling and the way that predicates must have must be declined in a sense must suffer a certain declination 
in order to fit, you know, to different levels of description within, for instance, a metal beam, a description of, of, of a metal beam, a micro, microscopic description, description of a metal beam, for instance. So uh, Wilson's main uh, examples are scientific descriptions, right? But it's quite interesting that, yes, I think it, it, can, it can be mobilized in order to talk about localized, uh, localized logics in a sense, uh, generally, right? And, uh, but it is also a Pittsburgh guy in the sense that it is it, it, even- It's a different it, department. I checked the website. Yeah. yeah. No, but but I know Brand and the, the guys have. No, I'm just kidding. It's just yeah, I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, what I'm, I'm I'm aiming at is that. Um, a gente pode falar em português, viu? Todo mundo que fala inglês tem bom. Yeah, mas aí a gravação já está passo. Ah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, no. Okay, yeah, just be very ridiculous. Talk to three people in English, but then. Yeah. Vou parar a gravação, que aí a gente continua conversando. Yeah. 